<laughs> we're live. And we're live. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this interview. Today we have the wonderful and actually someone I consider a close friend. We have Pete Morbacher today on the stream. So everyone, welcome hey, him. So as you know, these are part of the new series I've been working on where I've been interviewing artists to get more insight on their journey so that you guys can learn not only more about the ways that they got to where they are now, but maybe they've gone through similar struggles or they've hit similar roadblocks that you guys are feeling today, and maybe this will help you get over those. And I know Pete has a really successful journey, at least in my opinion, and he's got a lot to say, so I'm sure that there will be a lot of very divisive topics that we cover because... Uh, I, the thing I appreciate most about Pete is he's always honest, and I always love talking with him because I never feel sugar-coated, so I hope you guys are ready for this. <laughs> and <laughs> the way that we're going to set this up is we have 10 questions that I ask every artist, and then we're going to go into the Instagram questions, and then lastly, we're going to get into the viewer questions that you guys have that are watching live right now. So if you want to put at Bonnert before any of your questions, I'll kind of gather them up and then I'll type, or I won't type them out because I could hear me clicking on the last interview. So I'm just going to write them by hand and I will save them for the very end. So if you have any questions for Pete, just make, just know that I'll get to them near the end. I'm, I'm not forgetting you guys. So to start this off, Pete, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I feel honored to be here. Oh, the honor is I always honor. like hanging out and talking with you, so this is easy. easy <laughs> this is easy mode today. <laughs> yeah, it's either this or email. I would love, I'm so happy to be here, Tim. You have no idea. <laughs> I mean, oh, that's you, you, that's you great to hear. You are the one person I think that hates email almost as much as me. Maybe even more than me. I think more than, I haven't checked my own emails in a few months now. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're one of the only people that actually hates email more than I do, so you might appreciate my, my situation. Thank you so much for giving me relief. Yes, I'm glad I can The situation be... I put myself into. Right, I'm glad I can offer a distraction for your work productivity. <laughs> All right, let's not waste people's time, let's jump into it. What do we got? Okay, so the first thing is just give a quick, brief intro on who you are and what uh -huh. you do. Oh, uh, brief intro. Um, I used to be... In game development, and I used to do illustration for Magic the Gathering, but I quit all that um, because I didn't like to deal with bosses and people telling me what to draw. Um, largely because I, I felt like I was doing uh, better work when I was uh, just making for myself, just painting my own stuff, designing my own designs, and um, so I took the gamble and said that I'm probably more valuable to the world. Uh, being self-employed, making my own art and selling it directly to my fan base than by working in some studio and making my art director's life miserable. Uh, and it turns out I was right. Uh, I've been successful as an independent. I've uh, built up a bit of a fan base, nothing huge, but enough to, sus to sustain me really well. Um, my uh, fan base, they buy stuff on my website and they support me on Patreon. And all together, they've allowed me to have a normal middle-class lifestyle that's been much better than when I was you know, working for regular, the kinds of jobs that I think a lot of people aspire to. So um, I forged this sort of alternate path for myself. And then I've also tried to help other people who also enjoy being self-employed how to do things for themselves by broadcasting. I've got a web show called One Fantastic Week where we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. And then I'm always just trying to help people out. If I feel like I can be useful to them, I try to be a resource. And um, and yeah, am I missing anything big? Anything that you think <laughs> I should point out? No, that was great. Okay, great. I feel I feel like you're, you're pretty good at doing all this, so we'll just jump into the 10 questions right away. Right, let's do it. Because, well, well here's your challenge, because when I did Velarte, he... Mm -hmm. The 10 questions took about an hour and a half, so we're hoping that we can get the first 10 in like an hour frame. Okay. All right, you ready? Yeah, easy. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so first question. Growing up, when did art seem to grab your attention? I spontaneously had a moment when I was 16 years old where I woke up and I felt the need to go and grab a bunch of art supplies and start making stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd always drawn as a kid, like, a normal amount, but then there's just one day I woke up and I was like, I bet you we've got a bunch of art supplies in the house. I want to start making art. I think it, it was like I was in the throes of a serious uh, love affair with anime uh, that okay. I think really kindled it. D Divulge. And, what anime? Oh, uh, even Galleon was an uh, early one for oh. me, but just like anything I could get my hands on, because we're talking uh, 
beginning of the 2000s. I think this was year 2000 exactly. Yeah. And um, and getting anime involved going to the weird dollar rental store in my town that had a huge anime collection. And then it was getting fan sub VHS tapes off of like sketchy looking websites where you would send them money orders. You would fill out paper money orders at the post office and go mail it away to some uh, weirdo on the internet. And then they would send you back a box of VHS tapes, custom VHS tapes with like uh, stuff that had been fan subbed. Because this is all pre, this is pre Kazaa, yeah. you know, pre file sharing and torrents and shit. <laughs> Kazaa. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Napster like, and LimeWire. I mean, it was a revelation when I was downloading Samurai Champloo <laughs> off of Hotline. So, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm 36. So I've been at this like fan game for a bit. And um, I've, I've gone and done some, I've, 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 uh, I've crossed a certain um, generation of technology along yeah. with my fandom so yeah i <laughs> uh so yeah so that was the time when i got really interested in it because i was like a huge I, I was just like total loser in high school huge weeb and uh i was i was getting my anime fix all the time and i decided one day to try to draw and then i started getting attention for being like the the kid who could draw almost immediately yeah and that was like a big big deal i was i've been so used to being ignored uh, as somebody who's just irritating and has nothing to say that like uh, <laughs> having like a having like a trait that people were interested in was this massive shift for me so being able to draw and get people's attention that way turned into this huge drug and I've just been I it's never stopped being a major part of my life ever since you know that one weird impulse when I was 16. yeah also I want to note that Elaine's here and she says that we're wearing the same shirt. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're wearing the official artist uniform. I assume it's because you're also inspired by uh, the Apple CEO, Steve Jobs. No. Oh, wait, actually, yeah. I'm sorry. It, it, it is a little bit. I love the idea of, of not choosing what I wear every day. That yes. whole, like, you know, uh, oh. decision fatigue thing, I think, is kind of real, but... I started to develop a collection of shirts that actually have things on them again, so I'm doing a bad job at that. No joke, I bought like five black t-shirts just for when I'm on live or like doing these things. <laughs> and I hate to even admit this, but it's because, did you watch The Inventor on, I think it was a Hulu? No. It's the girl that invented that nano, the blood oh, drawing system. yeah, okay. <laughs> Elizabeth Holmes or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, um, here's the thing. <laughs> Men of a certain age, which is apparently us, um they, they this is actually a bit of a generational thing uh um, really guy white guys in their 30s wear a lot of black t-shirts it's kind of ridiculous i mean yeah um, i fall into that yeah yeah and it's like you, you as and then i just like look down i'm like oh damn it like i see him out on tv or whatever and you just see like some white guy in his 30s and he's wearing a plain black t-shirt and jeans and you're just like it's the uniform it's the uniform of our generation it's it's almost tacky at this point, it, which is hard to do considering how simple it is, but it is. We're so far <laughs> off topic. Please give me the second question. All right. Second question. Well, this is where we get into the fun ones. At least for me, I don't, I haven't seen your old work past, I think I've seen like the past eight years of your work, I assume, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen work from a while ago. So the next question is, can we see some work from... Uh, three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, whatever you uh, got. Dude, they, I've got an entire hour and a half presentation <laughs> of this, like, lined up. You have, like, a um, PowerPoint ready. You have, like, GIFs ready I, to play. I seriously do. And then I've got even, I actually have even more because um, I was digging through a box of sketches yes. recently. And uh, I pulled out some stuff, some some really ancient looking stuff. I want to hear Do I have, like, the... Did some of it not upload to my Dropbox? That would be a shame. All right, whatever. Let's do some screen sharing and let's get it going, huh? I'm going to swap some windows around. And uh, we're going to screen share. You're going to see for a second what I'm, what I'm working on, which is not a secret. Um, it's a cover for the clamshell that's going to be around my books. Okay. I have never heard it called a clamshell, but that totally makes sense. Oh, uh, yeah, the clamshell package. I mean, you can see uh, uh, the camera's not up anymore. It doesn't matter. Anyways, okay, so what do we, where do we want to start? At the beginning, at the end? Yeah, take us what to the, the oldest peak drawing that you have, and then we'll go to the more recent ones. Okay, so um, 
the do, 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 let's look at the most iconic painting of mine from my early career. This was the point. This is an interesting entry point because this is like the second digital painting I finished, but yeah. it was also published in like art annuals. Like I got attention for it on in like art communities, digital painting communities. Oh. Um, and so it wasn't, it's not, of course, not the second time I picked up a, a Photoshop and tried to paint in it, but it is like the second time I ever like finished a thing. And uh, yeah. so really, really early on, and like if we go scroll back just a little bit, this is like the first one that I finished. Ah! And the, the thing, I had this big revelatory moment because I had a bunch of, oh man, I wish I had stuffed more stuff in here now. Um, <laughs> Like, oh my gosh. Here, 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 let's go all the way back. I've got, uh, this is me doing a uh, weave drying swim. Who is this white haired character? Who is this? What? Who is this white haired character? Some OC, just some crappy DeviantArt OC. What? Um, you have a DeviantArt yeah. OC? What's his name? Yeah, of course. No, the, uh, Bernard. Ah! Um, it, 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 so the, um, you know, and then I, I've got my other OC box here who's, yeah, so this is like, the best drawings from like these time periods going back to early 2000. Uh, and I probably got some scans of stuff if I really dug around, but this is what we got for today. Oh and my God. so this is, uh, yeah, this is like April of four. So um, this is around the same time as that crow picture. And I basically went from, you know, doing these kind of like loose, sketchy sort of watercolory half finished looking things yeah to doing full digital paintings and the key was really really simple um i just realized that if i were to continue if i were to dedicate myself to just continue to make marks until i could not figure out how to make it more refined and more like the references i was looking at then i that's that's where i would i would call the piece done that all of my work before that i was just kind of like getting confused or getting lazy about it. And then I would stop and that's where it would be finished. Yeah. And I was going to say, it doesn't matter if it takes me 40 hours, doesn't matter if it takes me hundred hours, I'm going to draw every little thread and stitch and whatever, and just make all the little tiny marks mm -hmm. and just let it be tedious. And as soon as I did that and I dedicated to just like, I'm going to figure out how to smooth stuff out and have that take as many brush strokes as it needs to. And I'll draw every strand of hair and I'll draw every little stitch and it's fine. And when yeah. I did that, I immediately started producing results that people were paying attention to. And I was like, well, this is really fucking easy. That's like the easiest lesson to learn ever. You just hold yourself to the highest possible standard and you just become, and you just, you know, work patiently and you won't produce the best piece of art ever, but you can surpass what you thought was possible very quickly, especially when you're like a beginner and you're early on in your journey. Like mm -hmm. you don't know how good you are. So, um, and I, I see people get stuck all the time because they're just, they're just not willing to give it the time. And so I started assuming that pieces took 40 hours and, you know, as a beginner, this took me 40 hours to draw all the little stitches and stuff. Oh yeah. And then like right after that, this is my next piece, just going in there with a round brush and drawing every little crack in the leather or whatever, <gasps> oh, experimenting yeah. on how to draw every little tiny feather and smooth everything out all individually with a little round brush. And uh, it was time consuming, but it wasn't that bad compared to how long it takes a professional to finish a painting. And I had done several thousand sketchbook drawings by this point. So I was starting to develop like a, a style and be able to draw out of my head. And so there, this, this is like a piece that hides all the things I'm bad at and has a few lucky breaks. And, um, and yeah, it's it, there's still like a print of this hanging in my parents' house because it was like this ah. <laughs> formative moment for me in my art career. I okay, a lot of questions from what you just showed me just now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you definitely answered the next question, which kind of worked of like what piece defined your growth and progress. So this to you is the one that defines. This is it, yeah. And I've got an updated version of this one too. I've I've re-illustrated milestone pieces for myself throughout my career, so we can look at some comparison shots too. Because. Another question is, where is yeah. the recent Bernard work? <laughs> oh, um, let's see. I kind of, oh my God, you, I've got stuff. Let me just see <gasps> if I can. Do you really? Yeah, well, the thing is, I haven't done Bernard. Bernard also changed genders at some point. Oh, it's a. Changed to Beale. So Bernard is now Beale. 
Beal, yeah. Um, let's see. Do do. Um, first, what am I looking for? Personal work. Um, there should be a finished folder in here. All right. Okay. Cool. So there, I I didn't put all this stuff in. Did I haven't done one of those? I haven't I haven't worked with this OC in a really long time. Okay. So the um, here we've got this is more recent. <gasps> Yeah. This is again. This is also in the folder. This is from this is from ten years ago, um, because it's just like at a certain point I started focusing on. We should just go through the JPEGs. Go through the JPEGs. <laughs> okay. I've got a whole timeline here. Okay. So we've got the early stuff, right? Yeah. And we've got some DeviantArt OCs, and random weird formative pieces where I'm just like ex experimenting with trying to shortcut the process a little bit by doing some, you know, photo manipulation mixed with painting. Um, and, you know, this is like really typical of the, this time of like doing fantasy art, OCs, you know, it's kind of anime-ish, but also really painted and yeah. also kind of digitally, like I'm trying to figure out like how much soft brush I can get away with. <laughs> um, but also it's kind of poorly drawn, like it's, but but also it's poorly drawn, but there's a shitload of time put into it, so it's kind of still doing a thing. Oh and yeah, it's definitely getting me attention at the time, which I'm enjoying. Ooh. And like, there's just a the the thing that bugs me about these older pieces is really the design sense more than the the rendering and stuff. Like I feel like the weirdness of the rendering almost turns into a style, but the crappy design sense is really just a matter of like a lack of pre planning. Oh no, Pete! This is this is so fun to look at because to me, immediately read as remember Faust from Trigon. It's like that merging with the yeah. uh, yeah, Samurai yeah. Champloo character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like very, very much like pulling that anime aesthetic, which people don't connect the dots on these days. And this one, I, I just really, I, I still like this piece. Oh, this is another one that was like another OC. That was like. Another formative piece, like when I was going to convention, I was going to conventions with this work, and this was a piece that probably sold the best. Oh, I believe Just because that. it's dynamic and it's detailed, and like people dig that. But like there was there was no pre planning, so so much of this was me trying to figure out how to fill in areas with detail, yeah. Rather than having like a smart idea on how I was going to paint this stuff. Ooh. And you can see that this is the same OC as this guy here, yeah, Keldon. This is from 15 years ago. And then we move forward about, this is roughly 15 and roughly 10 years ago. So a few years forward, it's like some of the hallmarks of my painting style are like the total ignorance of how to modulate my edges. So all of my edges are super tight. Yeah. So everything's either smoothed out and rendered or super hard edged. Well, except and for so that well, hand on the bottom. I can see you huh? starting to loosen up with that hand. Yeah, it's just like I didn't know, I wasn't using a lot of reference because I was used to drawing out of my head. So I, I wasn't pulling in a lot of reference to look at for painting either. And so, you know, I'd get a sense like a gesture, but I wouldn't actually look up a specific anatomy. So if I started to get hazy on it, or it was like, you know, not a central part of the painting, I would just like, it being loose was more of like a lack of ability to feel like I was finishing it rather than me recognizing that it's okay to be loose. Because if you look into the background here, these insignificant background elements, they start to get a lot of detail for no reason. Yeah. You know? And this is why when I see that in an amateur work, I go like, oh, I know exactly what you're doing. I, I, I recognize that in my own stuff. But there's like really, really hard edges on everything because I feel like the tighter the edge, the more finished it is. Yep. It's either, if it's going to be textured, it's got to be textured. If it's going to be smooth, it's got to be totally smooth. And if it's going to be a hard, if it's going to have an edge, it's going to have a hard edge. And everything's cut out like, almost like, an, like you know, separate elements of, uh, in an animation cell. Ooh. And this is around the same time. And this isn't even an OC. This was just a doodle that I was like, oh, I like this face. And I painted it. And this was on my business card for a while. I like all these old drawings, Pete. Yeah, yeah, they're fine. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I like this certain design aesthetic, but it's it's not like a character design. It's more of just like a aesthetic mishmash. Yeah. But uh, those are fun, yeah, though. It's, it's not one I end up really resorting to, 
again these days because you know everything's so different i'm moving away from like fantasy characters and into you know i don't know what angel there even is it's <laughs> thing but there's like an obvious mix of sort of sci-fi and fantasy together in in some of these yeah and it's just me trying to take whatever sketchbook drawing happened to seem the best in the sketchbook and figuring out a way to make a finished painting out of it you know without a real intent on what the painting was going to be about just like good drawings should get finished into good paintings yeah yeah oh um Ooh. and but then there's like this other side thing that starts to come out where it's not really a character. It's more of just, I'm enjoying the process of painting things like clouds and I've kind of given up on soft brush. Yeah. And I've started to learn how to like get various edges in my paintings and get that painterly look and, um, you know, just get more surreal with it. I mean, this one's so good, especially going from the last one to this one. It feels like you really yeah. jumped. It, I think there might be a couple of years in here, but it's still in the, like roughly ten years ago. Okay. Era, but this is like the the phases of my progress will be more clear when we get to the Angelarium stuff. Mm. This is around the same era of like you can see the mixture of sci-fi and fantasy together, and. Um, you know, I'm still trying to do really dynamic stuff, more like what like Riot does nowadays. Oh like, yeah, you know, kind of like rough, painty look. Actually, and, yeah, um, yeah. And then you know, still occasionally doing like the OCs and things. But yeah, and then then we're jumping to five years ago. Mm. We've got what is still pieces that I'm selling today that are still a major part of my portfolio today from Angelarium. And this is oh, this one. is actually from five years ago at this point that I've been, this has been my main body of work. Um, and uh, it continues to be my main body of work, you know, five years later. Um, this is all, you know, post going independent. This was my, this was actually my first piece that I did when I started working full time on Angelarium. And it still remains, really? you know, one of my favorite paintings from the series five years in. I mean, a lot of I, the artists that I talk to about you, they this is the one that they often bring up. Yeah, it was. Um, it <laughs> I want to bring up the the context for this. Also, let me, let me pull up the tab here. Uh, there's a magic card that I did right before I complete this regard. <laughs> it's the last magic card I painted, and it stinks. Like this, this painting stinks. Um, I wouldn't say stinks, Pete. It's just, it's boring and it's messy and it's kind of crappy. And it was done within one week of, uh, of this piece. Oof. These, these paintings were made a week apart. And this really? was like, this was me being frustrated with having an art director that didn't get me and like being like art directed to death. <laughs> And then this was me being left to my own devices, being the person in charge. I was actually basing this off of Eli Manai, one of Eli Manai's concepts. Um, so he's he's credited for the concept of the hands reaching through the hole in the chest gag. But yeah. um, this was, you know, I was art directing him through that process, and then I was making my own interpretations of the um, the work he was doing. So I was like, this is a reverse of the sort of power dynamic of where I'm in charge versus somebody else being in charge of me. And uh, the attitude is really different. They're, it, I feel like the vibe of them is 180 degrees apart from each other. Yeah. And like one of them is one of them is something that people think fondly of and remember. And the other one is like a total fucking mess. And and this is like a to me a perfect illustration of like why I went independent and why it's continues to be the right choice for me. Oh, for sure. I mean, even just comparing these, Pete, you're you're right on how powerful the contrast is where the one on the left obviously feels like you're able to breathe more. I, I sense so much of you in the art than I do on the right. Where the right, I wouldn't have yeah. even been able to tell that was you if you would have not said it. Right. But like, you know, I was, you know, dreaming of this, this world of being able to be self-driven and like, this relief of escaping like 
this feeling of being beaten down. It, like it's all in this painting of Bana, where I related to the the subject of the painting also related to where I was in that moment in my life. So that made it like I feel like that that feeling got crystallized in there, and mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it's just like I can't uh, I can't not relate to this painting in that way. And it's such a you know a positive moment that's informed so much of all of the years of work that have come after it. So it's like it, it remains like a very powerful and central part of my my work, even even though it's five years old at this point. It's like not a lot of so this one's like a few years later um and then this one's just from like three years ago mm -hmm. so it's like uh I, th I think i've continued to get better at painting and my work has gotten more precise and more detailed and i've done more control over it over these last few years but the overall amount of impression that it leaves is actually not that much different than this point where i sort of broke out on my own five years ago yeah. um but then I want to, I'm going to go into, I want to go into these a little bit. Let's see if I was trying to get these to show up in the right order, but they might not. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is from, ah! 2000, this is from 2004. <laughs> this is Angelarium series one was 2004, <gasps> right? Wait, seriously? Yes. 2004. And then Angelarium series three in 2015. So this is my least, this is the least popular uh, Angelarium painting of all time. And this is maybe the most popular and it's the same character. So like me re-illustrating stuff has, has really gone really well for me over the years. Um, well, I mean, look how gorgeous that is though. So <gasps> it is series one in 2004, series one in 2000, series two is in 2006. Two years later, I got way better at painting. This was, this was like the last year of college and then a little bit out on my own, like no longer having to do school work, being able to invest in myself, holding myself to a higher standard. I got better really quickly in that one year after college and I went and I re-illustrated the entire collection. And then this is again, oh, series three done in 2015. And it's just like, again, makes the older version look embarrassing by comparison. Wow, I didn't know you read your, I mean, oh, oh, I know what that one turns into. Yeah, and it's like, <laughs> uh, and so I've got more. So this is yep. one, 2004, 2006, 2015. And it's like, there's so much learning about color and materials and edges, and it's just repetition. And then here's 2019 where I feel like now I have like so much more control over the whole thing that I can, I can level up even further. I don't really like saying level up, but the, you know, there, the, the jump, there's a jump still in my career that I don't think has fully become apparent because like, um, you know, when I'm just doing the exact same concept three times in a row, there's a limit on how much better it can get. Like I need to start evolving the context for the work in order for it to still look like it's a it there's a um, quantum leap forwards for it yeah well not so, to yeah. be on the nose with your last one but it it feels more grounded in a in a mm -hmm. lot of ways and your color palettes are so sophisticated it's like old master way of mixing colors together well this is i mean the color palette in this one was based off of like classical oh well. <laughs> yeah uh, I mean, some of the stuff from the same era, I, I take inspiration from a lot of stuff. So this is the original Sahakiel 04. So this is series one, series two, series three. These are amazing, Pete. I've never seen these back to back. Yeah. So that's the thing is I've lived with these in a way where I've just like had this character as being a part of my history. And I'm like, mm -hmm. in my head, I see all these images, but I know that people come in at different points and they've only seen maybe one version of it or they knew about the collection in part, but they've never seen all of the stuff. And even if they've seen all uh, the stuff on the website, they haven't seen the old series one and series two pieces. I, so I, yeah, just like, I haven't seen these. Uh, this is great. Yeah. This is, I mean, it, the big, one of the big jumps I was saying that like early on, I just didn't know anything about edges. 
I also had struggled with color, but I was just kind of winging it. There was a point where I, I realized like how to, how to fuck with edges and how to like modulate edges and what that could do. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you, you learn about lighting, you learn about color, you learn about basic mark making and it allows you to jump from here, which I thought was like, where else am I going to go? It's, it's all rendered. It's yep. finished, you know, what are you going to do that's better? And then, you know, you, you learn how to be better because it's, um, there's still always something to learn about painting. That's definitely something I want to ask you about more later too, because I think that's a lot that we all feel is this is the best I can do. Yeah. And then a few years later, hindsight, you're like, oh no, that wasn't the best. But yeah, we'll continue though. Continue. Oh, there's number one. There's number two. The drawings for these also make a huge, huge jump. And there's number three. <gasps> this, uh, the change the wow. Head. I had some arms. But man, oh man, did I learn how to use values in composition. Yeah, for, for look at the... Time. God, your color palette is so gorgeous on this. It's I learned a lot about color in those nine years or whatever difference between the two. Well, and even you're working so much more with mid-tones than you were before, where it was such a contrast yeah. of like light and dark. And then all of a sudden it's like a lot of mid-tones and like specular highlights. <laughs> the big one of the big jumps here is this is before when I worked entirely on a computer. And then this is years of seeing my work in print. Where I realized, uh, <laughs> like, this doesn't reproduce right. Yeah, no. <laughs> there are all these super saturated dark shadows in here. None of this shit reads. Like, and so I yeah. get on, I get on uh, digital painters' cases about this because I'm like, dude, I've been there. You need to stop. Like, you need to learn where you can put a shadow. Like, you need to tuck it way up in there, or have it be a silhouette. But you can't have huge globs of it. It just it turns into nonsense on the wrong monitor, or when you try to print it out, it just looks like shit. And I've learned that the hard way. So I I've learned how to properly you know modulate my values so that stuff can reproduce. And you know, just like you know putting bounce lights and like fill lights on stuff to be able to make it so that it looks nice and sculpted. Yep. Um, you know, without being washed out. I feel like fill lights often get overlooked in in. Right. Uh and trade for like direct light and like a hard rim light. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I like, that was one of the things is because during the time when I was like learning a lot of the, during those years between those, the series two and three, I was working on magic and you couldn't get away with rim lights because it printed so small that you needed to oh, sculpt yeah. the figure in a way that didn't use a lots of little tiny rim lights because they, the, the you wouldn't get a single dot of light ink on the card because it was just too little area. So you had to use something that looked, that you could read like from a thumbnail, you know? Yeah, that totally makes sense. So yeah, so I've, I've got that. And there's there's even more that we could go into. There's, it was been really fun to dig back through all this. Um, one of these is kind of cool because it's like, I thought there was this huge jump from 2002 to 2003. Here, wait, let me, whoa, like, wait, I gotta hide my head really quick because I can't see it. Hold on. Okay, now go. So, like, I thought there was this huge jump between, like, 2002 to 2003 where it was like, oh, I learned how to use color and I got way better at drawing, like, the same character. And then it was, like, over the course of a year, I learned how to just apply digital paint at all. And uh, I was doing um, an art test for a company called Vicarious Visions. Yeah. They were doing the Skylanders games. And so I was doing art tests to be on like the Skylanders team. Cause like, there's another weird side thing where like I've drawn since I was like, came up in anime, like yeah. I know how to draw like chibis and stuff. And so <laughs> I was like gonna potentially get, I had a choice of either going out to San Francisco to work at like a, a tech startup or go out to New York and work on like uh, kids stuff. Yeah. And uh, I don't think anybody expects to see pieces like this from me. Could you imagine they, if you went that direction? They ex they accepted the art direction and that, I mean, uh, uh, they accepted the art test. They liked the art test and they also liked my interview. Uh, but I, I took it the other job. So like, this was like a, an option that was presented to me. Wow. Um, and so this was like a totally, this was a door that was open to me for sure. And I decided to, to not go that way. Because I'm just like, you know, when I'm left to my own devices, this isn't what I draw. But it is a thing I can draw yeah. if I'm being paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really, uh, yeah, I think, I, I, I'm, I don't know, maybe it'll come up one day. 
man, you did such a good job with all this. I was not expecting this level of like <laughs> preparedness. Some Woo. Of the weird anime stuff. Um, I never figured out how to draw a background on this guy because it would be too much perspective. But it was like a the drawing came out really dynamic, so I didn't yeah. have time painting it. And it's just like, uh oh, now I need to draw a background behind the character. Stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, this is, it's wonderful for me because obviously before we were friends, I was a fan of your work, and I, I feel like I'm seeing inside this treasure trove of hidden gems that I probably don't get seen very often at all. Uh, this stuff does not get brought out very much, no. No. You don't uh, see this posted on Instagram as a throwback Here's, here's like a, a more modern version of the OC uh, that I remember this one. never got finished. Didn't you have something similar to this, though? Because I'm pretty sure I saw it at your booth, like, way back in the day. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Like, maybe. I'm pretty sure either this one or there's another white-haired character, but it was a human, and you sold it as a print. That's... That was... The... I brought that one up already. I don't know, maybe. Yeah. But that was Bernard. Probably. Now I know. Oh, oh! Uh, here's I got some really ancient stuff. Some of my first attempts at um, <laughs> uh, did some did some really bad ones. Let's see. I'm trying to find. There's one in particular that was yeah. This was like the first time I tried painting digitally. Me wow. drawing the OC, and I printed this out, and I thought it was like a big fucking deal, and everyone in my D and D group like ooed and not over it. They're like, oh my god, you made this. <laughs> <laughs> this is like first attempt at digital painting. And oh my I gosh. was so much better than the other kids in my college by I would like if I like pulled this out, they'd be like, Oh my god, like you're amazing. How do you do that? Because I was the only one in my school other than like one other person that owned a tablet. Because yep. that wasn't like essential learning. There was no tablets in the school because the school was way, way behind. And so I started painting digitally freshman year. So by the time I got to be a senior, I was still one of the only people that knew how to paint. And people were like, oh my God, like, how did you learn all this stuff? I'm like, uh, the internet. Because <laughs> the school sure as hell wasn't teaching it to us, you know? Yeah, I think that's a little fun trivia fact. Me and Pete went to the same school, but like years apart from one another. Yeah, and Pui also. Pui was in my Photoshop club. Was he really? Was hosted. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I had like a little Photoshop club because I was trying to find the other people that knew how to do this stuff because the school wasn't teaching it to us. <laughs> and uh, and like, yeah, Pui was one of the members. He was so quiet. I like, he like never said anything. He would just kind of show up and hang out. Oh. But now he's more, now he's more open. Yeah, now he won't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I love him though. I've got a ton, ton of like weird off the beat path, not Angelarium stuff. I remember and, like, seeing this. One, this is probably my top Instagram post of all time. Is like the one fan art I've made in the last <laughs> ten years. I don't know. Well, what was the next question? What we got? Okay, I could go down memory lane forever. Yeah. Oh, I mean, this is this is so fun for me to watch. Like, as someone who truly enjoys your art, I always tell people I don't want to boost your ego or anything, but I do tell people that. You are one of the best living digital artists alive today. No, no. Nope. <laughs> I, I, Definitely not true. <laughs> are you kidding? Seriously, though. That, like when I, 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 I'm, I'm, um, I'm a B plus designer and a C four <laughs> painter. Uh, and a and a and a C plus business person. The funny thing is that nobody's that. It seems like everyone's got an F in at least one of those things. <laughs> and uh, and that's the way I end up getting ahead. Uh, so. I just happen to be pretty good at a, like a bunch of things all at the same time. Yeah. And um, and I'm sort of unapologetic about my aesthetic, which helps me stand out. And that's been my key. Like, it's it's not a matter of quality. I you know, look oh. around and see like how no. many really amazing no. painters there are from a technical perspective out on Instagram. And I know I don't get jealous because like I know I'm, I'm so happy with the way that my career's turned out, and I'm yeah. confident in like what I've invested in in my, you know, in my career to, with, with my work. 
so I, I like I don't feel bad, but I also know where I stand, like from a from a skill perspective. Oh, and I know it's like I am not at the top. I have figured out how to sort of dynamically maneuver around that as an obstacle, which is what I recommend to most people. You know, you invest in the things that you're good at, and you don't worry about the things that you're not good at, and you don't beat yourself up over. I, I don't even know why I'm letting you run through this because clearly you're not right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so right. Anyways, go to your next question. Anyways. Like, you write about that one, too. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, you kind of already answered which one to find your growth. So then the next one would be, well, I mean, you kind of showed a lot, and I, I kind of have a idea of what you might say, but what is a piece yeah. that you have a personal connection with that stands out amongst the rest? Is it the one oh with the God. hands going we through? Already, we did definitely go over this. Like, if there's, there's two, there are landmark pieces for everybody, right? It's that side profile and, and then the yeah. hands through the chest. You want me to bring up one more? I've got another one. You, another like personal connection? Um, yeah, let me see if I can find it. You, you've seen this one. This is the one with the girl and the thing. The girl and the weird floaty guy. That's half uh, your uh, art. What? <laughs> <laughs> There's like no girls in my heart though. That's the thing. I don't know if you realize this, but we there was like one girl in it, all those paintings we just looked Weirdly at. Weirdly enough, most of your angels I see as women. I don't know. I, I'm sure I'm projecting that onto them, but um, it depends. Most of them definitely not. Um, but <laughs> I mean, people people have, people have often gendered my male characters as female. I don't know why. Oh, happens to me every art piece I do. So yes. <laughs> um, but this piece. So this is another. Oh this is yes. 2013. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this was this was a big, you know. Uh, touchstone moment for me too. So, oh, also here's a remake of that crow piece from oh, also, is that 20, really? also 2013. Oh my god! Because when I, what's funny is this is your profile for I believe yeah. it's on Discord or no? Yeah, yes. It's on a few social media ones. There's like a oh, and here's a <laughs> somebody drawing a dick on my work for at, on 4chan. <laughs> there we go. That's <laughs> funny. True art, you know, modern. Um, art. I always thought this was a profile picture, like a no. portrait study. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not even of me. If people think it looks like me, it's yeah. totally, totally not. Um, but yeah, it was a remake of like a critical piece for me, but painted decades later and or a decade later. And it's, 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 it's nice for, I like to revisit stuff like that. But so the crow guy, the first one was like the yeah. very first super important piece. And then Bina, the one with the hands going through the chest, is also like a major milestone piece for me. And then that was like kind of preceded by Wake, which was, you know, uh, was yeah. which was sort of a divergent point where I did exactly what I wanted to creatively with a personal piece, but without um, it being part of like a brand. Yeah. And I was like, I, I, I took a long look at this road and I was like, cause this was a path towards doing freelance art and trying to get like jobs as a freelance illustrator and on like, you know, mm -hmm. on my skills as a painter, someone hires me to be their wrist. And this is me taking a, me trying to make the best possible piece I can from that perspective. And um, it like, I'm really glad I didn't go down this way. Cause not only, if I feel like I've illustrated why it's important for me to do my own stuff, but it's like this, this piece didn't even get me any gigs. It like, uh, somebody, Corey Godby told me that it almost won a spectrum award, but it, I, I, I didn't quite make the finalist for being nominated for a spectrum award, but then like nobody hired me after seeing this, like art director saw it and they're like, Oh, okay, sure. You don't want this, you know, but, um, hmm. I was like, I think it was a really good painting. And it's one of the best I've ever made. At the time, it was the best I, painting I'd ever made. And it was like, weird. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it still stands very strong, for sure. I'm still very happy with it. I still yeah. have strong feelings about this painting. Absolutely. Um, but yeah. So, uh, I, I, but if, if I had to narrow it down to one, it would probably be that first crow one, just because I don't know where the hell that thing came from. I spent, I spent a really long time trying to get that good again. Um, I, I think it must've been 
five year, five more years before I felt like I could sort of touch this in terms of quality. And I didn't know what was right about it that wasn't right with my other work. But I just like, you know, you get one of those things that outpaces your current level. Mm -hmm. And then you spend the next several years trying to catch back up to it. Oh, God, that's like a whole good topic right there that you could divulge on. And so, but this was the first time that happened, and it was so far ahead of where I was. And it was a far ahead of where everyone else I knew was. And it was like, you know, I, I just got, I felt so lucky that like this door just flew open and I saw the opportunities out in front of me for independent success and jobs and all sorts of things suddenly became possible because people were paying attention to my work as a result of this one piece. Yeah. And so, you know, as much as other stuff might be like these other signposts along the way, you know, this is the first one. So that's probably the biggest. Okay. Cool. What do you got? Okay. Question, <laughs> question number four. <laughs> sure. uh, how do you hope people see your work? Um, let's see. Well, let's, um, let, me, let me make a perspective on this. Let me craft a little home for the answer. Yeah. Um, I think... I want people to like my work, right? Um, yep. I want me to like my work, I think more than anything. But um, if I want somebody to, uh, if I want somebody to get something out of my work, I want it to feel like something, I want them to instantly recognize it, where they look at it and they say, damn it, I thought I came up with that idea. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to feel like I have stolen a portion of their imagination. You know, where I have found, I want to find some sort of common thread in human experience and put that down on a page so that when people see it, they instantly go, I get it. Like it hits them over the head and it just feels like this mad, crazy magic trick where I like reach behind their ear and I pulled out a memory and I show it to them and they go, that's the fucking craziest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Like, how did you know that's what my imagination looked like? And so I'm trying to find an honest view into my own way I visualize my thoughts and feelings in hopes that pe other people are doing it the same way as me. And so when they see the art, they get this uncanny experience of feeling as though they've, they already have a relationship with it because it's a part of them already. And like, because I think that's, a, that's an awesome experience to have. And it's also the path to having a career as an artist. So the fact that like my uh, my big lofty goals align with my like very <laughs> uh, practical goals, yeah, uh, it's really nice because then with them not fighting each other, um, that promotes me to try to do like really good work. My best work is rewarded in ways that sustain me, and um, that's that's really cool. That that's the place this is in society these days. That art can support its creators in that way. So yeah. That was, that was a good answer, Pete. Mm. I want to see your face though again. Oh, sorry. Shit, I got my screen share up. <laughs> hey. There he is in the red quarantine room. Yes. Okay. So the next one we have is how do you balance... Oh, this one's good. Uh, you will definitely be good at this. How do you balance the dual life of running a business and creating without monetary intention but I art purely for yourself? I got a text the stream, steam, stream crash 15 minutes ago. It did for like 20 seconds. Don't worry. I'm oh, so okay. good. Elaine I'm, is texting me. I'm so good at being technical. No, I'm saying that's a lie. I just quickly like stopped and re-ran it again. I was like, please. Oh, I was okay, like, okay. all my fingers were crossed <laughs> under the desk. All right. Well, we didn't lose anything important. No. Nope. was the question? It li actually, the stream literally came back on when the chibi was up. <laughs> or the chibi. <laughs> I was that's like, good. oh, this is perfect. This is perfect. Total swerve. But yeah, the question was, how do you balance the dual life of running a business and creating without monetary intention? So art that's purely for yourself. Oh, that is a good pivot. Yeah. Um, I think I have believed since for a while now that if I do a really good job creating for myself and trying to create from like a an honest place mm -hmm. and be pure and expressive about it, that that will lead towards financial success which means that I don't feel like I need to juggle between the two impulses. There are ways where the desire to be liked and to receive attention will, you know, lean towards something or lean away from like, you know, 
your best, most honest creative impulses. Uh, I'm in a fortunate place where uh, what I want to do and what people want from me are very, very similar. So uh, I could get away with like just sort of ignoring the financial um, incentives when I'm when I'm working on the creative stuff. Yeah. So I like I swap between them where I I spend time working on a piece and doing the best job I can with it, just as an artist for art's sake, and then I take whatever gets produced from that and I try to make good choices as a business owner where I try to like, you know, make the best product as far as prints and merchandise and whatever else and try to do the best choices with marketing and, you know, with working relationships with people I work with and all those other things that cascade down from it. But I get to leave the creative part of it intact without having to battle back and forth between the two. Yeah. I always, I don't know if you feel similar, but I tell people it's like switching hats and like when you do your yeah. art, you put on your art hat and then when you do the business, you put on a different, cause it's a different way of thinking. Yeah. And it's, um, I, I don't, I've, I've seen Ted talks where people with authority go up and they say that the two things are in conflict and what you need to do is learn how to just give up on part of your dreams. <laughs> and I'm just like, really? Oh, fuck you. Uh, yeah, fuck off. Uh, how about I don't? I'm doing fine not giving up on my dreams. And so I am not going to go out there and tell people that they should give up on theirs. It seems stupid and ridiculous. It, it, we live in gifted mm -hmm. times. And um, we're very fortunate because that may have been true to some degree at various points in history, but it is less true now than it's ever been just because like they're are a lot of options for creative people, especially in the United States and Europe right now. So, Oh, for sure. Um, even in the quarantine times, even in the dark times, there's still opportunities for people who make stuff. And I think that's really cool. Actually, I think it's forcing a lot of artists to think differently. So put on their online sales hat, which mm -hmm. usually maybe they don't, especially if they're primarily convention artists. I got, I yelled at a bunch of artists recently about how they weren't producing a lot of art. And that got was fine when they were only doing conventions. But, um, you know, throughout the time when I've been successful at mm -hmm. like convention sales and everything, I've been making new art constantly. I have been producing at least one piece of art every month with only a couple of exceptions for the last five years on a really strict delivery schedule. Because yeah. I was like, I've always believed that the value of my entire business flows from the fact that I'm always making new art. And I'm constantly trying to make my next great piece of art. And I don't get to choose when it happens. I just get to choose to keep showing up over and over again. Yeah. And so this is the, the thing I'm pushing on a lot of my peers right now is like, if you guys want to survive during the dark times, you have to get back to the drawing board and start making new stuff and not like new merch lines and launching new websites. You need to make new paintings like yesterday. And like, you're doing this, yeah. like you're producing a shitload of new pieces because you're like, I want to get this deck out. I need to make the pieces for this deck. I need to be making. Otherwise, I'm dead. <laughs> like there's, I won't have anything. And um, it's a scary feeling, but it's motivating. You know, it's it's a, all of our value as as creators comes from the process of creating. So we need to be need to be engaged with it all the time. I I almost wish you were. We had the call last night, you know, and it was, a lot of the debate came for like being prolific and Babs, Babs Webb felt like she wasn't being prolific enough. And we were talking about, you know, how we have different strategies for it. And it came up like what you just said came up. And it's weird because I actually do agree with you on a lot of levels because I think the artists that usually do the best financially are the ones that are just creating like all the time. Well, Babs's boyfriend manages a gallery and he's like, all the artists that make a lot of art sell a lot of art and the artists that don't sell, make a lot of art complain their art doesn't sell. And it's like, it's frustrating. And you tell them, you got them <laughs> stuff and they go, well, I don't know, they, you know, they have stories about why they're not or whatever. But it's like the people who get past those stories and just make the stuff, you know, they end up doing better. It's just way easier yeah. um, when you're prolific. And I've never been a super fast painter. I mean, my, story of starting off is deciding to, to spend an indefinite amount of time working on a painting. So the yeah. only choice I've had is to just not take breaks. Like I don't need to be painting every day, but I need to be delivering a painting like every week or every month, like whatever delivery schedule I'm on, I need to be 
serious and consistent about it. Oh man, Pete, there I got I could talk to you for that's hours trick. about this kind of stuff. Uh, that's the trick. I mean, the consistent. It's like have you ever talked to anybody who's in amazing shape, someone who's like a total gym rat, and they're like they're totally ripped, and you're like, how do you do it? And they're like, consistency. Every single one of them says the same thing. <laughs> it doesn't matter like whatever bullshit workout routine you have. You just need to be at the gym on like five times a week every week and just not stop doing that for like several years and you'll be in amazing shape you know mm -hmm. and and there's like no shortcuts and the same is true with art it's like you don't need to be painting for 12 hours a day you don't need to be on rigorous study routines but you do need to constantly be delivering stuff and challenging yourself every week and every month like without stopping and if you go back and audit yourself and you start finding, oh, I only did three paintings last year, you're in trouble. Like that's a huge danger sign. You need to like get those numbers up. Those are rookie yeah. numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, it's funny. I, I wish you were there because I feel like you could have given such good insight because. Uh, I, I, I mean to be on these calls. I know, I know, I know. What I'm scheduled for. He's got to like at me or something. Oh, I'll do that next time. But basically, yeah, at, at me whenever those calls are happening. I love being on them. I mean, every Thursday at seven PM Central Time. But that's for you. Oh, okay. But, but anyways, the the thing that I wanted to add on and maybe get your feedback on too is uh, the debate went into. They thought I was a prolific artist, but when I was talking to them, it's like I think I had an unhealthy relationship with art because even this past two weeks, I've been up to like two to five AM every night just trying to finish this card deck because I think I I push myself to make a card deck too quickly, but. Uh, it's because I'm constantly forcing myself to be on a schedule to finish pieces that I've, I'm getting better, but I've been doing that for so long where you're just constantly pumping them out that eventually the quality just kind of goes up, 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 up. And kind of like what you were saying back when I was in college, I would, I would edge out everything. Everything had to be rendered even in the background elements. And then you do that enough times and you kind of realize where you can start taking shortcuts without losing quality. And I think that's the journey more artists need to take rather than getting frustrated in the beginning, um, being like, why am I not, why is my art not selling? It's like, well, because you just started doing digital painting six months ago and you yeah. still have a giant curve ahead of you. You know, when you, you're not good at it yet, you don't know what you're not good at. Like it's the, what's that, the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, the time Probably. I thought I was best at art was one month into working on art. <laughs> Oh, is it where it goes like that? And then it... really artists one month into doing it. Yeah. And then the longer I've done it, the more I understand the nature of the challenge. And so the more I sort of seen, you know, what my, you know, what my skill level is in relative to like the other stuff that I see. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, it's like when you're early on in the process, you just have no idea where you stand in that. And your, your brain keeps telling you like, well, I've learned everything I need to, but it's not working yet. What am I missing? It's like, well, create another hundred paintings and get back to me. Let, let me know where you think you are then, which is not advice anyone wants to hear. No, <laughs> no one wants to get that as like the feedback. Like, yeah, I don't want to tell you anything about your work right now. I just want to tell you that you will, you will get all your own answers if you can just make a hundred more of these. Well, and there's that underlying frustration hearing that being like, well, it's so much easier said than done, but that's the point. It's not supposed to be easy. Well, it's also not supposed to be said. It's supposed to be done. We're talking about delivering a product. We're not talking about having the mindset of an artist. We're talking about showing up and like doing the work, <laughs> delivering. You know, <laughs> nobody nobody wants to see you posting an Instagram post talking about how inspired you feel. They want to see the fucking pain, <laughs> right? If you're gonna show up with like inspiring language on why you're so inspired. <laughs> Everyone's going to think you're a joke. Like you need to make the work. Like that's why anyone is subscribing to someone on Instagram is not because their journey is so inspiring. It's because they like the stuff they make. Yeah. Well, and then you could argue that if you're so inspired, it should show in the work that you're doing. Yeah. Don't say you're inspired. <laughs> make a painting that shows inspiration. Like just do show, not tell. Right. This is like an old film adage, but it's, it's true. It's true in life. It's very wise. I'm I'm wise. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. Oh my god. Oh, okay. you're, you're baiting me into into making a fool out of myself. <laughs> no, honestly, I think more people need to hear this kind of stuff. I always talk about 
Hey, he, no, don't he, puff me up. Put it, give me I, another question. I don't. I was. All right. Next question. How is art defined? Who you've become today? Oh, I don't know. It's it's it is, art has been the underlying force behind every dollar I've made since I stopped working at GameStop. Uh, every romantic relationship I've had, every friendship I've had, uh, and the majority of my time, like my leisure time, that's not um, movies or video games. So. Yeah. <laughs> It's like nine. It's ninety five percent of like the the bulk of my life. There is like a. I have a few friends that aren't artists, mm-hmm. and we just like hang out and drink and smoke weed and look at like music <laughs> videos and memes and whatever. And like my, I've got a thread with them. I've got a text thread that has no creative content in it whatsoever, and it is like this one sliver of my life that's not art related. Like I can define everything that's not art. It's easier to <laughs> it's easier to point to the the not art section than the art section for me because it's just it's everything and everyone around me. It's, yeah. Um, which is like I don't know. Like before I had art, like I didn't know what I had going for me. Like because it's like what did I have? I liked video games and anime. It's like the lamest <laughs> identity of all time. I mean, that's probably a lot of us. I was probably similar boat as you, so I get it. Yeah. You're like, what do you do? I like anime. It's like, oh, I'm so glad I'm not coming at a Tinder profile with that. (laughs) (laughs) You you, you wouldn't reckon that's an immediate swipe, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. The next one we got is, what is the best, oh, I like this one. What is the best advice to an artist just starting out, and then second part of the question, to an artist struggling with where they are at? Oh, I think we just covered this. It's like, we did. Give, like, your synopsis. Is, You're like, to me, it's, it's quantity. Just stop, you, you just stop worrying and start producing. You gotta, and, and, and don't produce anything. Produce finished work. Mm. You need to set, it, there's so much about success as an artist that is about the schedule that you are spending time making stuff and the schedule you are spending like uh and the delivery schedule of how often you're finishing stuff and like your feeling of what you feel you should be doing and what your mission is and whatever else is so far aside from that so often it's deeply underappreciated how much scheduling ends up being like the major factor between like life and death when it yeah. comes to surviving as a creative person. I totally agree. Totally agree. <laughs> you're staying up late at night finishing pieces because you're like, I got to get these done by this certain date. Uh, this is how many days I have until the time I was going to launch my campaign. This is how many pieces need to get done. So this is like when this piece needs to get finished so I have enough time to do the rest of them. And it sounds like that wouldn't be the, the main reason why you're going to succeed creatively but it is so central to your success in this project and anybody who's going to ignore that fact is going to do so at their own peril if they're like out there looking for the perfect inspiration or quote or whatever to get them going but not doing that they are they're really in trouble they're really it's like i feel for them because it's it's a scary bad place to be like i want to help them i want to get it back on track well, look at that, I like that. Well, and I think there's so much to say about when you schedule yourself, then you already put into practice that you are going to be doing the work rather than just kind of dilly dallying throughout and be like, oh, maybe I'll work on this today. But I, I'm sure you yeah. do something similar. I like write down my schedule and like, no, I have to hit these by certain dates. And then you do become more prolific over time because then, you know, you have pieces that for sure were done on a certain time. Yeah, I, I don't really, because I have like this, I have a Patreon delivery schedule that's like, you gotta deliver a new painting every month. Like that's the main yeah. line in the sand. But then other stuff will come up. Like I'm working on this um, cover for this clamshell for the books. And it's like, I set a goal to have that finished by the end of the month also. So I'm like sweating getting this done so that I can, um, you know, hit those delivery dates. And, um, you know, unless there's a clear picture of what needs to get finished and when it, when it needs to get finished by, it's not getting done. Yep. Um, it's all back burner for a while. Yeah, it's all back burner. It's all Sunday. It's like stuff that you're going to like tell somebody about if they ask about it, but it's not actually going to be something that you are forcing, trying to force in front of people. Hey, I finished this thing. Take a look, see this thing I made. It's like, 
instead it's like you you know over a beer telling someone about your big idea which <laughs> is about as interesting as listening to somebody's dream i was just about to say that yeah. <laughs> well and i my my big thing that i say and i'm sure you'll well, I want to hear your opinion is I always tell people to not worry so much about the reactions they're going to get on social media, but rather create an art that is undeniably good and like strive to make that an art that you feel is authentic to who you are and the rest will follow like the financial gain, the whatever follower count you're aiming to strive for. Just make work that is undeniably good in your opinion. I'm not going to get into it with you. <laughs> all right. All right. This is off topic. Well, yeah, we'll get to that later. Just like that was a that's a Tim and Pete. I'll moment. fight you on that. I just don't want to fight you in the middle of this series of questions because you're bringing it up and it's in the side. It's like I'm like getting my boxing gloves on one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, actually, I that, think it might be a terminology fight. I think the fight we have is is more based in terminology than. Oh, probably. Because we're both stubborn and we like to. <laughs> yeah. But we actually made. Here's the last question in our ten questions. So you did good. It Wait. is what. What advice would you give about being authentic in your work? Um, I watch people over and over do things that they think other people want um, rather than what they want. And there is this idea that I've sort of stumbled across really recently where there's like, even when we're not making stuff, even if we're just liking things on Instagram, we there are certain things that we like that we're like hitting the like button on because they align with what we think other people want us to like. Like when I was in high school, before I got good at, at like being myself, there was like local bands that my friends were really into. And so I was like, I am also a fan of these bands. Like <laughs> even when my friends weren't around, I would listen to those CDs because I'm like, this is, this is one of my favorite bands. Like I was telling myself, to like it rather than like mm -hmm. having the authentic experience of liking it. And so I, I feel like I've, I've done that. I feel like everybody's done this, right? Yes, like, yeah. it's yeah. like a performative liking of things where there is a difference between really loving something and having like a genuine reaction to it. And like this creating a, a like a, a narrative about liking it. And if you start to recognize the difference, mm -hmm. you can really recognize it when you're working, where you just go like, am I adding detail to this because I, it's like I'm getting off on it? Or am I doing this because I think that's what people want from me? Yes. Like, I think that's what makes a good painting. And like, I think that you can trace this far out from just the creative life and into like the, you know, what am I gonna wear today? What am I going to, what music do I want to listen to? Am I listening to this band? Because I believe that like there's, there's social evidence to say everyone likes this and that it's really good and that I should be, if I'm not liking it yet, it's because I'm not getting it yet. Yeah. You know, or does this like, do I just like, my brain just absolutely love this sound for reasons I can't fully explain. And the more you can recognize that separation in yourself in your experience and then bring that to the creative process like the more successful you'll be at being able to create work that's authentically yours because you're yes. just making it because you just get off on it and not because you think anyone cares um because the that's like doing it just because you get off on it is like the way that you create really good work i, I mean I, I don't think I've seen a specific, a specific example of somebody saying like, I created this because I thought this is what everyone wanted to see. And then I was right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> even if they think there's some low hanging fruit, like I'm just going to draw hot girls because pictures of hot girls do really good on the internet. Mm -hmm. And like, I've seen some of these artists who they, it's like, you're like, Oh God, what is up with it? Every time they draw girls, it always looks like, weird and grotesque in a way that I, I don't fully understand. My brain instantly rejects it. And you're just <laughs> like, like, no, thank you. Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? Like, this is so strange to see. And he, like, you can see intention and authenticity in somebody's work. So like, and we all can, everyone yes. can. So when yeah. you see that inauthentic, like, attempt and that weird, like, you know, lack of voice, 
you know, I think everyone looks at it and it's just like, it's almost disconcerting. It's like, a, it's a huge turnoff. It's a, it's a giant, and it, it broadcasts itself. So obviously that lack of confidence. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's on all of our interests as creatives to make sure that we avoid that at all costs. Um, yeah, because it's, people are going to see it. <laughs> it, and it, there you go. Dude. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, wait, wait. Am I, am I cutting out? What's going on? Oh no, 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 no. You're good. You're good. I was I gonna say though. Repeat myself some more. So you, I love yelling at people about this. So you're saying to be more authentic is to do work that you genuinely, <laughs> in your words, can get off on because that's yeah. what will eventually you'll see the reckon or the resonation with other people and that you genuine. You know Mark Simpson meme where she holds up the potato. And she's just like, I just think it's neat. <laughs> <laughs> Like it doesn't need to be some grand thing of like this is yeah. what's like inside my mind. This is the this is the truest version of humanity. Yeah. Like it really is just a Marge Simpson just liking the potato meme. Yeah. You know, it's it's like or it's you know somebody's weird fetish where they're just like it's like well why why do you like that and then just want to see just want to see somebody step on my stamp collection you know. Well, it's like, I'm like, so glad that Sean is watching too, because he really likes drawing birds, but he always has that inner fight and that inner dialogue of, I should be branching out more, blah, blah, blah. But maybe oh, I should stop trying to mean, I should draw something besides birds. And it's just like, no, you should figure out how to make, uh, like how, where, there's a layer deeper than just to draw a bird, mm -hmm. right? It's like how you draw. And, or not even that, but like, is there a way of like satisfying that urge in a way that like, flowers and unfolds beyond just a drawing of a bird and the answer I mean, i don't know if, what the answer to that would be but i'm certain it's out there if it's explored but the urge of like oh i i, I should shouldn't be drawing so many birds because all of my pieces have birds in them and like insisting on doing something else for the sake of other people it's ridiculous it's the as guaranteed to backfire i like this piece i like this there, there are so many comments, and there's even some ones from, like, Babs has some questions, but I promise to those who are commenting in the chat, we're going to get to those at the end. We just I told been... Babs to just hit me up on Discord whenever <laughs> she wants to hang out and talk. I'll shout at Babs anytime. Well, her first question was, how dare you? But we'll get to her real question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start pulling some of the Instagram ones, and then then we'll do the, the users here that are on the stream live. Okay, so this one is from Arsenai. Says, "What are your plans for the future outside of Angelarium?" Um, this the dark secret of Angelarium is that at this point, I could literally put the Angelarium name on anything that I make. That's like something that's just like my aesthetic. Yeah, and so I could stealthily decide to start doing something that I felt was totally different. But so long as I continue to be honest with my aesthetic and calling it Angelarium, it's still going to be Angelarium. So I don't know if there is a post-Angelarium time or what. I think it was a question of like what would make me do something different or like if no. I have plan, plans for something to do something different. Or if, like if you plan on doing some bigger project outside of or, like even something that could be like a tarot deck or something because that's one of the other questions on here. Oh yeah, but I mean I would do an Angelarium tarot deck right now. I mean I like playing with these toys a whole lot and yeah. I'm going to continue to play with them for the time being. I've got big plans that I still haven't finished because like I had a bump in the road that is has massively delayed my my progress with this whole thing. So I have a number of books that need that I I really want to make, and then stuff that can potentially spin out from that that I really want to make, and then I'll worry about it. But for the time being, I'm like, you know, I'm like a kid who just got like a Super Nintendo on Christmas, you know, and like I'm like, oh, what are you gonna play after you don't your Super Nintendo? It's like, who fucking cares? You got a Super Nintendo, <laughs> you know. This is so it's so nice and it's so exactly what I want. Like I'm gonna keep wanting it and enjoying it for the time being. I'm not concerned about what's next because who cares? Kind of a side note, but I just mentioned, is that <laughs> Alan Williams behind you? Huh? The painting what? on the wall. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's an original, uh, Alan Williams painting next to an original Alan Williams drawing. I can like see it through the red sculpt haze that you're currently in. <laughs> oh, I can turn the lights on properly. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. I, I kind of like the lockdown. Feel. If you're... No, I, I kind of like the, uh, the look that I'm talking to someone in a bunker. <laughs> 
Oh no! No, I like the red way better. Oh, but look how good that painting is. Uh, let me see if I can get to it. It's not blown out. It's on the website. Look at Armor Us. Yeah. Imagine what I'm doing under the watchers section. You can see a good version of that. All right. Back to red. Yeah. <laughs> Back it's comfy the... on my eyes is why I like to keep it this way. There's a light bulb right over my desk. And so I got these smart bulbs so it would stop shining in my eyes while I was trying to work. It was either pitch black or like getting blasted in the face. So I, I got think... smart bulbs and it was like one of the best purchases I've made all year. I like to think it's because you're in the hot seat. Sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next one is from Next question. <laughs> Carandio says, what is your favorite color to work with? Uh, these days, red. I mean, um, this, <laughs> is like, figure. <laughs> this is like, I, I realized at a certain point, well, okay, I was working at um, Kabam, and we were making skins for digital characters, and they're like, the top skins that sell are white, black, gold, and red. And that's like it. And there's like nothing comes close. So if you make like a version of one of those, we could sell a ton of that and then everything else is like trash. And so and there's a certain point where I'm like, okay, well, I'm, when I make a special edition of something, I'll make it like black and red. And it sold really well. And I was also like, man, this is really punchy. When I'm flipping through my images, I come across one that's like all black and white and red. I'm always like, oh, fuck yeah, yeah that looks really good. So it's it's like I'm it's, I'm I'm always experimenting and trying out lots of different stuff. But then when I just get to do like doing like black, white, and red is like super easy mode. It's an interesting challenge to try to make a good image with a limited scope like that. Oh yeah. But it's also like if you if you succeed in that, it's so easy to have like an image that like you're satisfied by and also like hits people in the face really effectively. So that's probably like my favorite thing. And also now I've got all red lights and stuff, so I'm going hard on the red. Yeah. <laughs> Subconscious influence. Yeah. I like it. Okay. Some of these were kind of already answered, so I'm not going to go into those. But then this one's from uh, Unison. Do you experience dissatisfaction towards certain pieces of yours, and how do you deal with that? Of course. I mean, there's pieces. What's funny about it is that I will sometimes go finish a piece and think, man, that could have gone a lot better. Yeah. Or that certainly drifted away from where I intended it to go, or... You know, well, it's fine for what it is, but it's just not going to be a big deal. And then that piece blows up. And I go, okay, what do I know? Yeah. And then there'll be other times where I'm like, I nailed it. I'm super proud of this piece. It it represents uh, a creative accomplishment for me, and then nobody cares. I was going to say, then it's just horrible on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, sometimes they align where I think yeah. a piece is trash, and then nobody likes it, or I love a piece and people like it. And it's just like, it's random. You know, I don't feel like I have a lot of influence over the liking or not liking of stuff um, by other people. And so um, how I deal with it is that I, um, I, I treat it seriously. I treat all my pieces that I finish as though they could be my most beloved piece I've ever made. Mm -hmm. um, and I let people have their opinions about it and I don't tell them they're wrong. Like if somebody says, oh my God, do you have this one piece? like at a convention and I'll like have only a couple copies under the table because I don't, I, I don't like it. And most people don't either. <laughs> I won't be like, oh, well, oh, really? I don't have that. Nobody, that's a bad piece and nobody likes it. Like I am going to let that person like it. I will be happy to let people like the things yeah. that I like. And I will often, if somebody likes something that is typically disliked, I'll be like, oh my God, you've got really refined taste. Like, <laughs> you are recognizing something great in this piece that so few people recognize so you're like an accomplished liker for liking this thing that everyone else doesn't care about um you know i think it it should be celebrated if it's if it turns out that like somebody likes something that you think is not good yeah i, I think it's fine I, I think it's i think it's a good thing i think like people liking stuff is is good i kind of want accomplished liker on my business card <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite internet personalities uh, is he refers to himself as a professional game liker. <laughs> I mean, that's I, good, say, I like to think of myself as a game liker more than a gamer. <laughs> I like that. That term comes with a certain amount of negative connotation these days. Yeah. I like game liker. I, just my, <laughs> I, I like, I, I'm not a, you know, what do you call someone who's like loves art? An art appreciator. Yeah, I think art art liker. I think is a good. I'm an art liker. I think it's a good. I think 
I think it's okay to be an art liker. I like art. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not like a movie buff. I would say that I'm a I'm a movie, movie liker. liker. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, I consider myself a film liker. Huh. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it's funny that you even say that because I think even the pieces that may not do well socially, for me, I feel so strong about them that even though they didn't do well on social media, and I, I do get that sense of disappointment like immediately, like the following few days because I feel like I poured myself into it. But looking back at my career, those are still the ones that I think about as like milestones in my, my life. And I kind of like what you're saying. They might not always be in sync with being liked. But I think they still hold a certain amount of value to you, which matters more than, you know, the social response that you get. Yeah. And so, like, whether I like it or other people like it feels kind of besides the point. Like, the doing. The, what, the, or, yeah, true. The doing. I, wait, I don't yes. get to choose whether I like something and other people. I don't get to choose if other people like something. Like, my my reaction to, you know, success or failure is, okay, next. Yep. You know, I am going to celebrate the successes where they happen, and I'm going to endure the failures, and I'm going to move on to the next piece regardless of how this thing turns out. That has to be the, the choice because I, this, this, my life doesn't start and stop on how much people like my any given piece of my work. Yes. So how do I endure the fact that people might not like a piece I made? I'll make another one. <laughs> I feel like Fine. you gave such a golden nugget of advice that more younger artists need to hear is that you need to disconnect or like disengage from your art and how attached you are to it. Yeah, you um, it's like it's like mindfulness, right? You observe the disappointment, but you don't inhabit it. Like you yes. can be disappointed, but it doesn't mean you should make a choice based off of it. Like, what do you do with disappointment? Well, you observe that disappointment happened. And then you do whatever you were going to do anyway. Um, well, and how do you feel about the opposite, where if an artist becomes too proud of their work, especially in high school, it seems to happen a lot. Like you get so proud of it that you don't, you're, you're prohibiting yourself from growing more because you think that you've hit like the epitome of where you're at in terms of creative or technical ability, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't think that people's creative choices should be made based off of whether or not a piece is perceived as good or bad. Like, but do you know how often that happens? In, in the context of like its own creation without having to like get obsessive about, you know, how were the reviews on the last one, whether they were good or bad or whatever. You oh, should be yeah. making something else and you should be letting that piece be what it is. And that's it. But I, I'm telling you, I'm sure people come to you with this all the time of young artists that feel they cater so much what they create based on how their last post did. And I've even seen people oh, do I stories see yeah. about that. But I agree with you. I totally agree with you. I think you need to disengage from that. Like, don't let that pressure you one way or the other. Um, I have, I've often said recently that you have to be, you know, selfish creatively. Yep. You no, know, you can't. Just because yeah. people, yep. they liked a piece that you did and they want another one of those, if you don't want to make another one of those, you have to tell them sorry. Like, you're making whatever. Yeah. Okay, this one comes from Regal Snow. Says, which artist inspired you the most to be where you're at right now? Uh, mm, like, is Bexinski in there? It's tough to say because it's like it. Where I am right now is so defined by the structure of my career of being independent. Yeah, I'm trying to think of who would have been the biggest inspiration to that. Um, because I found out later that that was a thing. I found out after I'd already been doing it, that there were artists that had been already been doing it for 20 years, but I didn't realize that until after I'd already jumped in. Gotcha. Um, so let me redefine the question for you then. What artist okay. has consistently inspired you throughout the years, whether there's like peaks where you're really inspired and then they go dormant for a while and then they kind of come back? Um, I mean, it's like, I think I was, there's artists that I've, I've clearly been inspired by, like Brahm. Oh, yeah. Um, but part of the connection I have with Brahm is that Brahm was inspired by Japanese media because he grew up for part of his life in Japan. I didn't know that. Being an, being an army brat and like growing up on a Japanese military base. Oh. So he has like anime influences in his work that people don't pick up on. That like all of the weird like 
live men and gender stuff is like totally inspired by Japanese things. Like, I don't know if he said that to me, but I, I, I totally, even if he hasn't said it, I, I totally believe that like his aesthetic is defined uh, largely by, you know, a mixture of cultural mm -hmm. influences. And so I'm coming at this from the anime side also where I was like, oh, there's this Western painter that has a really cool um, painting style, but also conceptually is coming at it from a similar aesthetic as like this anime video game stuff I like. And so there's, it's like partially that I'm inspired by him, but partially that I'm, I feel like I'm inspired by some of the same culture that he was. Yeah. And so um, I feel like we have like common ground in addition to there being a sort of, you know, a chain of inspiration thing happening. Um, you know, I like it's interesting these days because like being part of the art club means that I've gotten to know a lot of people who I admire their work really heavily. So it's not like there's like some artist who's far away that I'm inspired by. It's like, I really like the art of my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's cool to be and that, that's not really the question I think people are looking for. So I think it, when it comes down to like, what is the thing that like just sort of happened to me, the art that kind of happened to me, I think it's like uh, video game and anime, uh, video games and anime for the 90s, where that like mm -hmm. stuff is like, you know, happened to me and it's not a like a part of a larger mutual relationship. Because, you know, I know a bunch of artists and I know they're, they're just a bunch of normal people <laughs> <laughs> who are good at some things and bad at others and they don't seem like um, mysterious and far away and larger than life to me yeah. anymore. Well, it's funny that you say your art's, it, you know, influenced from anime and video games, because when I look at your art, I see so much of Gex in it and, like, these other games of late 90s. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I see yeah, a lot of Ty and the uh, Tasmanian Devil. <laughs> yeah, what was the, the, the Gex one where he was also James Bond? Is it oh, the Gex? sequel. <laughs> yeah, <don't>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see that a lot in your art. I see you um, some of the design work in the early Angelarium stuff was really inspired by Shadow of the Colossus. Oh yeah, I mean that was like sort of you know later introductions into it, but like early on it was like Evangelion and like a bunch of other weird like '90s anime. I mean, kind of um, side tangent, but did you play the remake of Shadow of the Colossus? No, because I, I played the original one so many times. I was like, what am I going to get out of this? I've already I mean, played this game like eight times. I consider it the best remake so far. Well, until I beat Final Fantasy VII, but I would say that's the best remake because they did such a good job with, you know... Is there keeping... a question on Instagram about what's the best remake? Ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, we got... <laughs> I thought you'd find this one humorous. It's from okay. Legit Shout Out Pages. They say... Excellent profile, ten dollars for shout out. DM now, and since it's legit, I feel I should go to their page and. <laughs> oh okay, yeah, I get I get a DM every once in a while where someone's like, "Yo, can you look at my page and shout me out?" And I look at their page and I see like someone who's been drawing for less than a year, and I'm like four drawings, and I'm like, "Dude, why are you asking me for stuff?" Right? There's people all the time who like ask nice, and I talk to them about whatever. But there are so many people on the internet that just come at me with this weird demanding attitude. But it's like, if I step up strong enough, you'll have to respect me. I'm like, no, nah. it's really easy to ignore. I can just say, I can just click away from it without saying anything and leave you unseen for the rest of my life and nothing ever happens. You know? Well, I always, t I steal Bobby's Chu or Bobby Chu's way of looking at it where he'll, some t or not him specifically, some people will unfollow those people because he said that's not the way to get noticed. If you want to get noticed by an artist you really respect, do work that they'll like. And... Yeah. Don't feel like you have to cater your work to them anyways. If you really want to build up your brand, don't do it from getting shout outs. It's such like the the lowest bottom of the barrel way of trying to do it. Well, that's the thing is like shout outs don't matter unless the aesthetic of the person being shouted out matches the aesthetic yes. of the person who's doing the shouting out. Mm -hmm. Like we've seen this happen where it's like Jamila would shout out some other artist who was doing a bunch of like serene nature paintings mm -hmm. and they would like explode their Instagram would explode by like thousands of new followers instantly, right? Yeah. But like she's tried to shout out friends of hers that have different styles and it doesn't do anything. And like, so I, um, I rarely do shout outs in part because I don't want to waste my shout out bullets if I don't think it's going to matter. 
Like uh, <laughs> recently, I saw Jordan this kid Nino uh, was like a kid. He's probably in his late twenties. He um, he's not that much younger than me. Uh, he 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 was like, trying to promote himself on Twitter, and I like I was like I wonder how many followers Nino has. He had like eight hundred followers. I was like I retweeted. I was like, yo, like let's get this guy up to a, a thousand followers. And it like it it was like the one time ever where a shout out did anything where he instantly like got like two thousand followers off of me. And I was like, nice, finally. Yeah. Because his stuff is like really he's he's been inspired by my work and some of the same stuff I've been inspired by. So there's like a huge aesthetic overlap. Um, and so I was like, this is guaranteed to work. And it was super fun to do it. But like <laughs> everybody else is asking for a shout out is like, they're drawing like one piece fan art. And I'm like, dude, what do you, what do you expect is going to happen? Yeah. And I, I, I know what you mean by shout outs. They work like once in a blue moon. And I don't know if yeah. you know this, but the reason I back, this is six years ago. I went from 10,000 to 15,000 followers overnight because Loesch reshared me. And it was like this. Really? I woke up to it and I was like, what happened? And then I went well, to her she's store. She's also like an alpha predator in like the ecosystem, right? She's, yeah. like, <laughs> she's like a, like a, she's like a, a demigod in like the art circles. Just uh -huh. because her, her audience is so big that like, even if the, even if the effectiveness of a shout out is small, it's still, it's still huge. It can still produce huge results for people. Yeah. Okay, next question. This one's from mm -hmm. Kat Moosney, and she asked, why is he never at his booth? <laughs> oh, because Elaine's at the booth for me, because I I run a business that has, like, multiple different Oops, So here's the thing. Uh, it's like, oh, well, why don't you just go run your own convention booth? And now there's no conventions. Everyone's like, so how do you get sales on your website? Because <laughs> it's like I was staying at home trying to run this multi-arm thing where it was like, Patreon and web sales and convention stuff and all that all simultaneously. And I, I needed help to get it all done. So I had Elaine come in and start to run my booth for me at the majority of my shows. And, um, you know, it, it's an expensive solution and it's disappointing to some people that I'm not there in person. But now that like we've going through this major catastrophe, the fact that I made that choice has helped future proof my business against coronavirus. So yeah. that's why I'm not in my booth so that when, you know, the economy tanks, I have something to fall back on. And I'm not out of the, you know, I'm not like begging for people to pay attention to me all of a sudden. Instead, I can like make their <laughs> own choices. I can, work oh, on, yeah. I can work on relevant work and just continue along with the things that are functioning and like have a nice, you know, stable comfortable position because i didn't put all my eggs in one basket and i know kat asked that because she asked it in all caps too because she always like god i love pete but i never get to hang out with him <laughs> <laughs> so i think she's wonderful <laughs> and um uh, you know i get to Ooh. there we go when i'm at cons and elaine's there too i get to wander away because she's able to hold the fort down really good i know i always get excited when you're at the cons but i by what you're saying, totally. But then I'm at the cons and I like I see you and I see Kat and I see all of our people and I'm like, yeah. I wish we could just go off and do something else that's not standing around here making sales. We, I, you know? we still should. I still want to plan like a Euro trip or something. And so I wanted, you know, I was planning on there being a beach house trip this summer and then mm -hmm. that got totally messed up. But like, um, you know, a big, a big goal for me over the last few years is figuring out how to not have so much of my life revolve around work. And yes. that's a question nobody's asking, but it's a question I'm asking to myself. Yeah. Like, how do you not have it so that you go and you see your friends that you never see, and then both of you are working all the time? Like, that stinks. It's nice to, like, have people appreciate your work and make money off of it and stuff, but, like, when your whole life revolves around working all the time, you, you let a lot of stuff flow past you, yep. and it it's finding a balance is really, really important. And it's something I've done a bad job of. And while I've done a good job at a lot of this stuff, I've done a bad job at finding balance. And so that was going to be a big goal for me. Um, so one of my goals was to stay home more. So I'm winning, <laughs> I'm succeeding at that. <laughs> but uh, I was hoping to have more social travel that wasn't tied into work and that's yeah. not happened. 
Oh, God, man, I, I wish you were there for the conversation last night because literally this was talked about of, like, the existential third-personing looking at your life, and m most of us spend our lives locked in a room, you know, not locked, we yeah. go there on our own accord, and we just draw for, like, whatever percentage of our life, and we're missing out on things outside, and I, I've struggled with this balance, especially this year with the card deck, where I, I'm definitely not living more than I'm yeah. working, and it does take a toll. So even for those listening, like, yeah, we should be constantly producing work, but you should also yeah. balance it with life. Like, you got to find where that is for you because it's going to be different for everyone. Yeah, like, that's part of the reason I'm not at my booth. It's just, like, even if I were to get a really good work-life balance, that would it also involve me not going to the conventions. But instead, you know, helping my friends build their own stable, uh, semi-passive income so that we can all go and, like, hang out and do friend stuff instead of constantly be discussing how to, like, up our sales game and how to like how much money do we make at this event what's the next event we're going to and like constant work talk because it's just like you know i think uh I, i've always felt like i'm in a room where um i've spent a lot of time in rooms where i'm like around people that are 10 years older than me and like living in you know boring suburbs because it's like a cheap safe place to live and like and then i go out into the city and there's all these 20 somethings that you know basically just having a youth where they're social life is at the center of the world and i'm like oh my god what is that like yeah because um, i've never had my social life at the center of my world like and it's a major major goal for me to do prior to being like you know 60 and retiring <laughs> you know how do you get to a point where you can actually have like a real normal social life and not you know also be living off of a retirement fund or some bullshit like that you know do it while you're still young it's like a is important yeah, and it's tough when, you know, there's mixed messages to young artists of you should be working more and then you should also enjoy it. So Yeah, well, that's one of my messages that you need to be delivering on a regular schedule. Yeah. Under the warning of don't turn that into a, a exercise in working 100% of the time because it's bad for your physical and your mental health. Because the question I get all the time from artists is like, Hey, you know, I'm trying to climb the ladder and I've gotten some freelance gigs, but my hands are really starting to hurt. Mm -hmm. What do you think I should do? And I'm like, oh, go get a real job and stop doing freelance. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're going to need those hands for the next 50 years, but like, stop, stop killing yourself for, you know, $200 an illustration. You yeah. are going to, you're going to be crippled and you're not going to have an art career. It's going to be really bad. Like, don't do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I literally could talk to you about this for so much longer, but I do want to get some user questions because we're already user out. User questions. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go off of my main rants. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so for those of you who are watching right now, if you want to ask your questions, I've been keeping track of quite a bit. I've wrote them down. So I'm going to ask those first, but just remember to put at Bonner and I will do my best to gather it and then put it on the questionnaires as Pete is answering them. So mm -hmm. the first one we got from Femme says... Uh, a lot of people say inspiration comes from anywhere, but where do you get the most inspiration from? Is it from taking a walk in a forest, other people? What are you getting your inspirations from? Uh, probably movies. Yeah. You know, you just catch that one. You, you're sitting there watching a movie and you're seeing the way that the light is, is wrapping around the character's face and you're like going, oh, that's really cool. You know, you're deconstructing the way that they're like blocking a scene or creating a composition or like, yep. you know, doing something clever visually. And I feel like I've, I've gotten a lot of inspiration over the years from just seeing like really cool choices from film and photography. When I, my, my reference folder is probably more photography than it is um, illustrations. Oh, no, well, that's curious. I like that. Just cause like, you know, I, I realized early on that fashion editorials were better character reference than fantasy illustrations. They're phenomenal. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, you know, I think I got a reputation for being thinking outside the box and really I was just thinking inside of a different box, <laughs> um, which works just as well. Uh, so it's just like, don't steal from the person next to you, steal from a person who's like miles down the road and it's way, way better results. Yeah. <laughs> so and this one's from our very lovely Sean it says what is your process when it comes to choosing color do you have a palette in mind or is it all experimentation 
Uh, depends. Sometimes I am looking through my reference folder and there's a piece in there that I'm like, oh, 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 I think this, if I were to steal this color palette for this piece, it's gonna look really good. And so I will um, reproduce something from a reference. And sometimes I'm just flipping through stuff. Sometimes I'll have a vibe in mind, but I won't know how to assemble that into a color palette. That's just the challenge I'm dealing with right now where I'm trying to recolor an old painting in a clever way. And I have yeah. this, I have this image in my mind of what the impression is supposed to be, but an impression and an image are totally different things. People think that they could plug like a matrix plug in the back of their head and then you'd be able to see what's in their head and it'd be cool. But it's not cool. <laughs> not how images work. Like, it's like, a, you know, you get so excited about some dream you had and then you go tell somebody and they're just rolling their eyes. It's so boring to listen to someone describe their dreams. And so the same thing is true here. We have to be thinking visually and like the impressions that we get in our minds are just like, they're fluff, they're, they're, they're worthless. So I, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to puzzle out how to recreate an impression into in visual form is like the hardest thing ever. And it's rarely the thing that I'm trying to do, but I'm trying to do it right now. And so I've spent like the last three days messing around with like adjustment layers and washes and flipping things on and off and just sort of letting my mind wander. And I always feel like I'm close, but I'm never quite there. And I'm looking at this thing right now and I'm like, eh, maybe something. And then if it clicks, it'll click. But if it doesn't click, I'm just going to finish it, and ship it out the door. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think I'll, I'll get the next one from Babs because I'm sure she's waiting. Uh, so Babs. She says, how dare you? But then also, okay. you have transitioned from indie artist to a brand and an empire. What were the biggest challenges and how did that affect your art? I'm a tiny mom and pop small business. <laughs> get, get out of here. I'm an absolutely tiny mom and pop small business. Do you guys know what the size of a small business is? Like a million dollars a year small business is like a small, small business. I do not make a million, I do not sell a million dollars a year worth of stuff. Like that is like the size of like a small sand, corner sandwich shop. That was like half a million to a million dollars. I mean, a year. I like that's like a normal small business <laughs> size thing, and then you try to carve your salary out of it, and that's like what I'm making is like a little tiny mom and pop corner shop that's popular in the neighborhood, I mean, and it's Pete, successful yeah. enough to like allow me to pay myself, which it makes me feel really fortunate. But I'm not like an empire. I feel like it's good that you compare yourself to businesses that aren't just art, because I think that's how you're supposed yeah. to. Yeah. But, 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 <laughs> hold on. But in the spectrum of artists that make money, if there was like a bell curve, you are definitely on like the far right, like somewhere in that group of. There's there's a magnitude above me that I know exists. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, um, but I would I I I think it's a bullshit curve. I think that. Um, <laughs> oh well, yeah. Part of it is that most artists that are making a portfolio and sharing it around and participating in art socially are never going to be professionals. They're never going to be doing it as their main source of income. And that shouldn't be their goal. It's, um, it's a wonderful thing to be an amateur artist. And it's a wonderful thing to aspire to be an amateur artist, even if you're a professional. Mm -hmm. like, it, doing art for the love of it and enjoying all the aspects of it, like, is a is a is a very worthwhile goal to have, and it's a very good thing to do. Um, and so I don't think it's it. I, I think that by like letting those people get all that out of it without mixing money too much into it, is yeah. more healthy than it is like demotivating. Like I want to motivate people to really love the process of making art without getting down on themselves because it's not the way that they pay their rent. You know, there's lots of people I know that paid their rent with art that are killing themselves and making themselves very unhappy and um, could live a happier, healthier life and make better art if they stopped conflating these things. So what was well, the question? <laughs> I love talking to you. I can so, feel myself falling off the thread. Uh, I don't know. I know how much you love quotes, but the one that I really like that I, I kept as on my desktop for a while was um, draw and paint for as long as you can without caring about whether or not it's good. 
And at some point we lose that. And it's usually in our, you know, late teens or early twenties. I think what's sad though, is because social media, I think artists are now feeling that younger. So that when they're like 15, but it's like, you're still in your pre formative years. If you want to become an artist for you to care and put so much weight on the reaction you're going to get is just, it's far too early and just enjoy it. Enjoy making art, enjoy drawing whatever you want. And you don't even have to post it. If you want to draw Naruto, just draw Naruto. It doesn't matter if it's not going to be received well online. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Who cares? Um, <laughs> Babs, Babzo is responding to the answer and says, All right, you went from an ant to a beetle, and a beetle is much bigger than an ant, you dingus. <laughs> okay. I went from an ant to a beetle. And here's the thing. I measure, I am looking at myself in context of a larger world. You are. Like, I think if you look in, part of the reason I've gotten further than a lot of artists is because I stopped paying attention just to art, the art bubble. There was this one moment I had at Gen Con probably six or seven years ago, maybe, maybe around six years ago, it doesn't matter. There's a, the Gen Con art show. You've been there. Yeah. They've got these really nice walls that they make for everybody. And there is so many good artists. It's like maybe one of the highest quality on average art shows of like, any art show that I've ever been to. Gen Con's is just amazing. Yeah. And so you got all these artists all standing around the same place. And I noticed that there was the color of the carpet on the art show was different than the rest of the con. And there was, so there was like this literal bubble that you could draw. It was like almost like there was these invisible walls and all the artists were inside this little box, all looking at each other's stuff and comparing themselves to each other and worrying about how their money related to how much money the other person was making and how their stuff could look compared to the people who were across from them or whatever. And there was this inward looking bubble of people who were all milling around together. And I was like, I saw through the matrix. I looked over on the other side and on the other side of the carpet on the same aisle, you could see, cause it was like literally one row over were these other artists that had these like 20 foot booths that were like reaching up into the sky and had all these lights and shit all over them. And they were making like, <laughs> like five times what all of us were. And they weren't worried about how they compared to other people. They were doing stuff that was way more their own thing and not a part of gaming. And I was like, yo, did you, and I was, I was going to the bar and I was like, did you, are you seeing this bubble? Are you seeing that you're like just outside our thing? There's that guy, Nigel, the one dressed like a pirate with the 20 foot booth. He's making this all look like a joke. <laughs> and no one's even looking at his stuff because, you know, they think he's a joke because he's dressed like a pirate and he's not doing stuff that we think of as serious work. And they're like, who do you mean? I'm like, his booth is 20 feet tall and it's got, a, and it's got pirate flags coming off of it. And everyone is drew the booth is dressed like a pirate. And he's literally on the other side, he's five feet away from the, edge of the artist alley. And there, everyone I talked to is like, I didn't see it. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, it was like, I'm like, how am I the only person in, here yeah. who can see everything that's on the other side of the carpet like how is this possible and so i like on this mission to try to tell people guys there's like a there's this there's a larger context you know you need to under the people i know who really get this stuff they listen to like business entrepreneurial bullshit in addition to art bullshit you know they they have some understanding of what a small business is outside of the small businesses that are you know art businesses like you know you're not going to you're not trying to copy find someone who's like the perfect ideal that you want to be and then just clone them you're trying to be a better version of yourself so you need to learn lessons from people who have gone through similar challenges but are ultimately different from you and so being able to recognize that similarity and experience from someone who's like i don't know like they're like there's probably lessons we could learn from people who make all their money on only fans right like yeah. There's people who are have totally different life experiences and totally different types of businesses that like we don't aspire to be, but we can learn things from them. And um, so when it's like, oh, well, you're a bigger artist, you, you make more money than like the average artist. And I'm like, I'm like running a small mom and pop business. If I were to go to like some big entrepreneur guy and I'm like, tell him how much I make and how big my business is and how many people follow me on Instagram, he'd be like, who cares? Like you're tiny, <laughs> you know? And I, but also I don't feel bad that I'm tiny in that context. I'm very yeah. proud of what I've made. And it's like a little boutique thing. 
and it's cool. I get to own my little boutique thing and play with all my toys all day. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> if I were to start feeling bad about that, I'd be moving away from like what's like moving away from the whole point of it. Yeah. <laughs> Bab says, so get a 1080 webcam. Got it. <laughs> Yeah, I but um, no, no, no. But I think it, hold on. Just make note of what you're saying, so that maybe we can condense it. Is like widen your scope on what the realm of possibility is, is especially for a business owner and what you can do. Because I totally agree with you, and I know you're too humble to admit this, but you have had such an influence on other artists and other booth convention artists specifically. Because you took it from being just like a table that you put a cloth on and then some of your work to like this elevated form of presentation. And I think I think you do deserve the credit for kind of stampeding that. Well, I think campaign. that what happened is I'm straddling in and out of this bubble. So people are seeing me and they're like, whoa, what's going on? And I'm just like, I'm just yeah. doing what's over there. And they're like <laughs> refusing to look past me. And they're like, you're an innovator. And I'm like, no, not really. I'm I'm just doing something that's not like what all you guys are doing. I'm just copying different people. I'm taking inspiration instead of from the guy next to me, the guy the mile down the road. Yeah. And it's it's not that big of a deal. But also <laughs> like if you uh, if you re-narrow the focus back to like, okay, well let's compare the Angel Airing booth to all the other artist booths. Yeah. You go, oh my God, your stuff is so huge and elaborate by comparison. But then if you widen it to like all the booths in the thing, you're like, wow, you're on par with like sort of the upper middle, you know, <laughs> it's like stops being as gigantic and impressive. It's like, you know, it's on par with the, the retail shops that travel con to con and, and with like yeah. less income and less staff and less like logistical stuff than like, you know, a comic book shop that has like a, you know, a regular convention presence and has like a crew that travels around in a van. You know, I'm way smaller than those guys. And they're at every show and people see them. They just like, they ignore them. They have the whole Westworld vision where they're like, oh, it doesn't look like anything to me. And I'm like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> you should just, just see the people that are sitting right next to you. Like see the world that's right in front of you. See like the local bakery is like, yeah. has the same struggles that you do. Any independently owned business has the same struggles that you do as an artist trying to make their own thing. Except you make art and like, okay, this is a long rant. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that people don't, the thing that gets to me is the total lack of appreciation for the things that we have going for us as artists. Like, yeah, yes, the art game is hard, but so many businesses, they need to like either like manufacture or purchase like their products. Like, um, you know, toy sellers, they need to like buy toys wholesale from places and then they need to sell through a certain percentage of it before they like get their first dollar or like yeah. you know, if you're a bakery you need to be up baking bread every single day because your product goes bad within hours but like artists they just get to like put pencil to paper our materials are, are borderline free you know digital <laughs> artists it's just you're just putting your time into it and then you create these assets that are valuable for decades <laughs> forwards yeah out of nothing out of like zero materials that stay good forever and it's like the the being a creator is challenging but if you realize that being a creator means that you literally get to like make value from nothing that you just spend your time on stuff that you would want to spend your time on anyway and it creates like assets that you could build a business on top of that's ridiculous nobody gets that <laughs> like nobody no businesses have that advantage except for a very very small few we're in this rare cool territory we, we have this awesome thing going for us and i see artists just like never taking advantage of that and it blows my mind like you can just make valuable products with your hands out of nothing and then copy them without putting any work into it it's so good like talk to a 3d artist about their struggles of trying to get by oh they yeah. can't make prints i mean 2d artists have it so easy compared to 3d artists and so i'm like my God, like, how, <laughs> just like see what you have going for you, see these awesome advantages and then, then make something out of them. Oh, there's, there's so much I want to discuss with you because <laughs> I, I think why I've always enjoyed talking with you is because I think you like to play it off cooler, like, you know, I'm aloof to things, but at your core, you are so passionate 
And I just I like get really, really I excited know, about this stuff. I know. That's why I like tapping into this because I could literally just like it's like a balloon. You just put a pin in, and it just it streams out. And I like listening to what comes out because it's it is educational. I think oh yeah, you put of, batteries in me. I'll go all day. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and kind of, <laughs> kind of going off what you're saying too is Pui, our you know our friend, he'll go and uh -huh. he'll go to conventions that are not even art related. He went to a coffee convention, and he learned so much about presentation just from going to that. And it's kind right. of like what you're saying is you can learn so much about how to add on to your booth by not looking within your own realm. You know, look outside yeah, of that. Artists suck at this. <laughs> I feel like historically artists are bad at like building a brand booth, right? Yeah. So if you want to build a brand booth, don't look at the best artist in the room. Look at the best brand booth in the room. Is that a publisher? Yeah. Is that a toy maker? Is that like, you know, a musician? Or hell, I mean, look at the Marvel ask yourself booth. If that's possible. You know? Look at the Marvel, look at the Comedy Central booth. What are they doing with their stuff? How are they making yeah. these giant walls? Yeah. The Cards Against Humanity booth, they're like, oh, we're going to make hot dogs in here and give them out and have a giant inflatable hot dog in front of our booth for no reason. And it's going to sell them a bunch of decks of cards. It's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Create an experience, basically, with your booth. Or something, anything. Like, there's so many choices that can be made and so many strategies that are viable. True. And everyone's just sort of worried about, like, the guy that does the exact same thing as them but, but like, 10% different if they're doing enough like them, you know, it's like, that's kind of not the point. Yeah. And I, I'm, I mean, th this will get you on a tangent, I'm sure too. So I'll try to keep it <laughs> shorter. It's, I mean, you see a lot of people and I've seen a lot of people that will copy your own booth and your own art style to try to replicate it as their own. And just sure. from my personal third person viewing it, cause I'm not even involved with it. It just seems like it's a, kind of downgraded version of your stuff and it doesn't feel authentic to me in almost any way and I want to encourage people to yeah take inspiration from them but that doesn't mean you copy and paste it on your own stuff I think there's artists out there that have better boots than me <laughs> I've, I've seen some really good ones and like some of them are good in ways that people don't even really recognize like ones that are like look really clean but I know pack down really small and travel really easy so oh, it's yeah. really cheap to move them from show to show. Like what kind of so they can do a shitload of shows at like a way lower risk than me. Um, and I see some of that and I'm just like, oh, it's good. You guys have a good thing going on. But I only recognize that because I've had to engage with all the moving parts that like constitute my own operation. Mm -hmm. So like, I know enough about it to know, you know, what's good about what other people are doing and what's bad about what other people are doing. Uh, like I, I started to get into it with a student yesterday. I was, a, I, I was uh, yelling at some illustration students at Sean Murray's class and one of them did cons and they were trying to argue with me because they're like oh I, I you know I I make all my money off of pins and charms and selling cheap stuff is how I make I make a lot of money and I'm just like this you are not paying small. attention you are not doing good accounting you are not understanding like the larger scope of what you're you're up against here and they're and they were like totally writing me off mm -hmm. and I'm just like you know, you need to be able to look around and see the whole, until you can see, look at the room and know what, get a sense of what everybody's doing, what their challenges are, where their successes are, if they're doing good, if they're doing bad, if they're struggling, like what their history is. If you don't know yeah. enough to be able to like look around and really see the context of all the people around you, it is really tough to know where you are. And also um, to perceive what's missing in this market and how can I fill that void? Yeah, I, I sometimes see artists that have these crazy advantages, like they've got like a really strong audience and an amazing style, and they are undercutting themselves because everyone around them is doing like little artist alley booths and selling like bags and charms and stuff. Yeah. And so they do bags and charms and stuff and they make, you know, they might make f five figures in a show and they're like, that's huge money. And I'm like, okay, except for the fact that you could double or triple that if you were to do a good job, you know? <laughs> Yeah, like if you, you're doing a bad job, you're doing a bad one of this, like you're doing a bad version of yourself, but you don't know that because you have never experimented and you've never interfaced with people who do things differently than you. So you are stuck yeah. and you don't even know it. I think, and, uh, are you... and then so some, some Joey looking, you know, cis white guy walks up <laughs> and is like, yelling at them, man, you can be, you know, you can be doing a lot better. And they're like, fuck this guy. I'm like, yeah, fuck me. Okay, fine. You're right. 
I'm easy to write off. I and I'm not and it's it's not even a money thing. Like I, it's not I'm not gonna be able to convince somebody like should be more like me. I don't think that's true. I want them to just be a better version of them for their own sake. Cause yeah, you know, when things were good, when cons were running hot, everyone was paying their rent, right? <laughs> yeah. And everybody who didn't have savings as of a couple of months ago is in trouble. And this is why I got so heated about this is because it's like, it's not about, it's not about, you know, there being some tie between the money we make and our personal value. That's not the point. Yeah. The money is there to facilitate the work. And I want these people to do better with their businesses so that this sort of thing that's just happened to us doesn't crush them. I think when, I mean, you say that you're easy to write off and I've, I've talked with people where I get so frustrated by it whenever they kind of disregard it, because I think your delivery is very like tonal or like harsh sounding. But, sure. but I think people need to appreciate the value in what you're saying is so true and it's so honest and not everything that's honest sounds good. It's and the Gary V strategy of who's, communication. Who's Gary V? Gary V. Who's like, <laughs> Gary Vaynerchuk is extremely famous, uh, is an extremely famous guy who is known for being like one of the top personalities and speakers and experts in the entrepreneurship and marketing space. Oh, okay. And if, if like, it's like, um, it's like, uh, if, if somebody's like, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I know a little bit about basketball. And they're like, uh, okay. And then they're like, uh, who's Kevin Durant? Or like, you know, who's Michael Jordan? You know, like there are certain, like, the, Oh, if, I see what you mean. You know, it's just like, Gary V is so famous and so forward in like certain spaces that like not knowing who he is, mm -hmm. is to me like kind of crazy. Like I don't even subscribe to everything he says. I don't even think he's that like <laughs> he's worthy of worship or anything. I'm just like, it blows my mind that there's like, not, I'm not saying you, I'm just like, I know that out there <laughs> in the art space, yeah, half the people are out there Googling Gary V for the first time. And I'm just like, <laughs> that's nuts. That is nuts. Like, well, don't go and subscribe to every fucking podcast he's doing because that guy pumps out content. But, like, that was, like, I think we were asking, you, you were asking me <laughs> who's going to be all right throughout this whole coronavirus thing. And I was, like, oh, yeah. first, I was, like, Naomi's going to be fine. And you're, like, why? I'm, like, because Naomi knows business. Yeah. Na Naomi's got a photo with her and Gary Veek. She is, like, a total nerd about this entrepreneurial stuff in addition to being an amazing, like, world builder and and illustrator and um it's like you have to have a curiosity about these things like it, we all do man and so at least knowing the names of like the largest players in the space and like yeah. the basic concepts and the terminology is like essential you don't need to like ever become an expert in it like i think i said earlier i was like a c plus entrepreneur you know it's true if you look at me compared to like in the entrepreneurial space i'm not that smart i'm not that experienced and i'm not that big but i'm curious about it and i'm interested and i study it because it's like it to me it feels essential yeah um god Pete. i i feel like whenever you talk i have like these little i don't want to but i don't want to interject you because i know that these thoughts are so is, good and i want to keep that train running oh we can get to another question that's an actual question. <laughs> No, not even that. But you're talking about you're talking about tone, and it's like Gary V is a guy who's really right about a lot of things, but he has like this super abrasive attitude, and he, he can just talk and talk and talk and go on these huge jags forever. Yeah. And then I'm like, I recognize the same thing. I immediately disliked them as a result of that. I was like, ugh, who could deal with this? So I I get why people discount me because I'm like, it's the same reaction I have. I've seen that same performance done by other people in other spaces yeah. and gone like, oh, I did not want to listen to this guy. <laughs> so I assume that's how people react to me when they hear me go off on some big thing like this, is that they're going to have the same reaction I had to watching it. Um, but but I, also, people love Gary. There's a lot of people who love Gary Vee, so I, I hope that there's someone out there who like enjoys me going off on these super aggressive rants yeah. also. I mean, I, I just never think it's fair to just count you because I think you do have such a wide scope and variety of interests in how you build your own brand essentially that 
when you give someone advice or if you give them tips, it's not coming from this very slanted perspective. I do think you've gotten so, it, well, what most people would say, successful in the art world that it's hard maybe for you to talk to like someone just beginning. But I think your advice does transcend most barriers on what uh, are holding people back. And you know what? This can lead into our next question, <laughs> so yeah, that way you can. I, feel... I don't want to. I don't want to give it. Like I don't think that there is a lot of advice that is like not usable to people who are just getting started. I, I feel like I've got a whole stable of advice for them. Ah. Uh, Most of the time, they just don't want to hear it. Yes. Yes. Like most of it just involves me t yelling at them to make more art. <laughs> That's what it all it boils they, they down to. They don't want to hear. They want to get feedback on their anatomy. Yeah. Or compositions or colors or whatever. I'm like, eh. <laughs> well, oh man, I feel like I could be I could interview you for like ten hours because like I'm trying to refrain myself from asking my own personal questions because I'm like, no, right, get right, to right. The well, we can get to some. Put it as they say in the business world. Put a pin in it. Put a pin in it. Save for later. Let's drill, let's drill down. Okay. So next question. Oh wait, now I lost it. Where where did I put it? Oh, you know what? Okay, we'll do this one first. It's from No Man's Dream says, I'd like to ask Pete, what would be your advice on finding other inspiring artists to help inspire or find your style or brand? Which I know you've kind of talked about. Um, uh, I mean, I think that the biggest thing is not like where do you find it. It's a matter of finding a way of liking, of actually liking stuff as opposed to doing performative liking. Mm. Um, I think perf I think that people get stuck in a lot of ways because they find they're on the search for the best art. And you, this is where you and I butt heads about this idea of objective yeah. quality, right? And so <sighs> this is part of the reason I I push back against it is because people are always on the hunt for good art, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll put it on the tie on those buzz. People are always on the hunt for good art. And so someone out there is going, okay, I like this, but it's not good. Put it aside. Let's go find the good art. And if I could only find the yeah. good art, then I'd be properly inspired. And I'm like, you fucked it up. You <laughs> fucked it up right off the bat. Looking for good art is a waste of time. You just have to like what you like. Where do you look for it? I don't know. True. Maybe True. Pinterest, DeviantArt. Instagram, whatever, like what you like. You can like stuff because it's in your neighborhood. You can like stuff because it's in your favorite movies and TV shows. You can like stuff because it's in video games. Like you like, you, you can absorb so much from anything that you take in with your eyes. If you're an mm -hmm. artist, where do you find it? You find it everywhere. Like, but what do you keep and what do you throw away? And you keep the stuff that you genuinely like and you throw away the stuff that you think you like because, you know, it's seen as being the big, important stuff liking stuff because it's quote unquote good oh boy <laughs> it's like it's just like it's such a waste because then there's this race to be like okay who's the realist who's the most serious who's got the best shit and it's just like um that's not how this works you know i, I almost want to set up like a live boxing match of verbal conversation between you and I and like have three topics for the stream and like literally but have, have you ever talked with someone and you got the sense that they were they were trying to be they were obsessed with this goal of liking the best art I mean you can okay you and I might I think we agree a lot about what makes good art and yes uh, and yeah. even though I don't like the term good art versus better yeah right? And we disagree on the terminology, but I think we we agree very much about what goes into good art. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and my point is just about the liking, right? I think that everybody likes things that are not finely crafted. You know, yeah. everybody likes a little Tiger King, and they're in, in, ah, right. Totally love it. <laughs> um, people like. The Bachelor, like the bat, like a lot of really smart people love The Bachelor, right? And the Bachelor verse. Yeah. And it's just like, but there's this thing that happens where people who are trying to be better creatives, they go like, I'm going to stop liking things that are bad and only start liking things that are good. And so they start shuffling away stuff in favor of finding the purest, best shit. They got to find that that yeah. royal jam, that that queen honey. What's the best thing? And then you end up with like, 
you know, in music, you end up with this unlistenable garbage. That's just like, people were like, it's the most complicated, like <laughs> obsessive. And it's like these weird experimental crap. You see that in like the, the horrible performance art of people yeah. trying to one up each other in terms of seriousness, but without actually saying anything. And you know, you're not, it, it, there's a there's a pursuit in, in excellence that comes at the expense of anyone actually liking the stuff in the first place. And um, and we know where it goes. It goes, it's not just that it's like hoity-toity or like that it's like elitist or whatever. I mean that people <laughs> spend a bunch of time pushing away the things that they love in favor of the things that they think they should love because they want to they want to be liking the best things and not liking the worst things. And so we get this best worst, you know, mentality and it just, I don't know. I think it sucks. <laughs> like what, who should like what they like? I want people to be happy, right? I don't think that's a controversial stance. Okay, we're gonna get to the next question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where you could disagree with that. People should like what they like and that's fine. I think okay oh, uh, like i want this to be your interview so i don't want to you know inject my own all right, 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 right. next question you i will say though really quick mm -hmm. i think though too often people get so comfortable with the things that they do like and then their scope becomes so small because then they only are like within that i mean kind of like what you talked with convention stuff too yeah where, you have to stay curious yes i think that's Definitely where both of us agree stuff to more stuff i'm just saying don't don't discount the things that come up because you're not certain that they're appropriate for what you're trying to make or you're right you're real right or you're serious right. or whatever like you know you should be permeable to experiences you should be letting things yes in. yes i okay. and uh, i think that people become exclusionary when they try to be focused only on good stuff i only want the good things uh, the only thing I'll say is, <laughs> like with music recently, like I don't think I have the best music taste by any means, but what I do kind of pride myself is on, like uh, two days ago, uh, Ethiopian music came up on my YouTube random search, and I was like, I've never listened to that before. I'm going to just dive into that for the rest of the day. And I, I learned a lot about things that I like about a culture and a music that I've never heard before. So I think you should throw yourself in new scenarios for sure. But I think you can walk yeah. away from it, kind of picking out the things that you, and I know it's but all. That is what I'm, that's what I'm advocating. Yeah. I just think that people, people become too obsessed with social proof where they're like, they're looking for indications of what's good. And part of that is what did everybody else like? or yeah. going against what everybody else likes. Like, well, if everybody likes it, it's gotta be bad, but if nobody likes this and therefore it's mine now. You know, just don't worry, like remove yourself from the proof of what is good or bad and actually just enjoy it or don't enjoy it on your own terms, be your own critic. Yes. <laughs> I think not controversial. I think, I think everyone agrees with that, but I don't, I, I don't think that we all practice that as much as we think we no. do. I think to be happy in like life, I think that that is the best advice you can take because then you, you're not worrying about financial gain or, you know, your social credibility, whatever. I agree with you on that for sure. But I think if you take it from a purely business standpoint, I think that's where we could argue a little more because you see so many artists that create what would be considered not as great, maybe mediocre level of art and they keep pumping out the same thing and wondering, why am I not making yeah. money? But I think for me it would be, you need to elevate the quality in your work. And I think looking or like spreading your scope into artists that have done that either that are alive today or dead and look at like how they mastered their craft and try to take notes from that and then apply it to your work. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I just, I question how much of my own progress has been a result of me being an art liker and how much of it be me an art maker. And I think, I have put a lot of the weight on just hmm. the number of pieces I've made and the amount of time I've spent with them and the amount of like digestion that I've done on working on the surface, you know, S trying something yeah. out and seeing if it does anything to me accomplishes more towards building that sense than any museum I've ever gone to or inspiration I found online or anything. 
and um, there needs to be a balance of the two. But yes, I really I put the progress uh, on. I credit the progress to the just spending time with the work and not so much like me congratulating myself for liking you know good things like. <laughs> I mean, we'll we'll have a debate with us later. But... <laughs> All right, but I, I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to really quick pee yeah. outside, and then I'll come back, because I think you'll be able to talk about this one. Um, okay. It's from Old Man's Dream says, as an amateur artist, I'm really interested in the difference in edges you were talking about. Can you elaborate on that? So kind of back when you were oh, talking easy. about Yeah, let me, yeah. I'll do a screen share, and I'll, I'll All right, be right back. Okay. Right. I've been poking away at this while we've been talking. Um, uh, let me open up b -b -b between like these two. I think are really, good. and I think they're both high resolution. Also, good. Okay. So uh, older work, everything. I I was starting off by making like a under painting that was um, like a really hard flat. So you know I was creating a silhouette with a hard edge like this, and you can see this all around the character has a super super tight edge. And then the interior space of the character is more smoothed out. And, um, but it, it's like I'm not intentionally making some edges harder or softer. I'm either trying to make it smoothed out or I'm trying to like find an edge. And that's kind of like the, that's, a, that's like the, the first observation. But it, there is a level of depth that goes past that point. When we start zooming in on my later work, um, one of the things that you see is that things actually start to soften up in in places, which you it seems almost like it would be a mistake at times. Like, oh well, this doesn't look quite finished. If you're only looking at this edge, you would say, oh well, this isn't done yet because it looks blurry and there's no details in it, and uh, and you're wrong. Like there are there should be areas in a painting that are blurry and lacking details because they're out of focus in some cases i'm actually letting i'm intentionally making it so there's no edge like you can see there's no edge at all between the edge of this strap and the this guy behind it and so you can actually and if you look around at, at paintings you will see this much more so than you do in um photography and like it does happen in our field of view where we just lose an edge because the color on the inside of a form is similar to the color in the background behind it and they blend together for a moment and then they separate again as the contrast comes back out. So um, one of the things that uh, an amateur artist will do is because this looks wrong to them, it looks and feels unfinished, they'll try to like work in a little thin bit of contrast across everything to try to make it all feel more done. And uh, what, what's, what's actually happening is it's, it's making it feel, it, if you, even though it feels right in the moment, it actually creates a uh, impression that feels more incorrect. That like a painting is not intended to be like a photograph because it is creating the impression of the thing rather than the thing itself. And so the better mm -hmm. I've gotten at painting, and you see this in master painters, uh, you advance over the course of their careers is that you, you know the goal is to get better at creating the impression of the thing without expressly creating recreating the thing as it is because it um it kind of tickles the brain in a more effective way it it gives you a faster stronger more complete sense of what the artist is seeing um, than if you were to do it exactly as is and, and perfectly accurate so finding ways of making a kind of imperfection, like blurriness or losing edges or lack of contrast, um, in ways that serve the impression of the piece, actually really advances the way that the work looks. Um, and beyond that, you know, there's just a certain amount of control that is required to do it. So um, I have this in my built into my brushes to a degree as well. So there's like we have like a, a, a continuous edge, there can be parts of it that are really, really soft and really, really blurry. And then there's parts of it that can be just like, oh, th this is just like already naturally because that's when my brush is set up. It's like 
just a little blurry. And so like if you're transitioning, uh, if you have a, a lot of dynamic forms that are all transitioning into each other, uh, you can't just have it be all smooth and all hard. It has to be like a nice mixture of some areas that go close to being an edge, but not quite. Like you need to be able to have a strong control over how much something is blending versus not blending, like how quickly those transitions happen. And that's one of the reasons why I don't like using a, a um, soft brush because when you use a soft brush, it's like always yeah. like a, a fully smooth curve from hard to soft. So you end up with, you know, this like fully smooth curve when really you want to be able to like shoot a curve up like this or like, you know, make something stair step in ways like you need to be able to have control over that. Like this brushy look is actually a curve that goes like this a little bit and has these little stair steps in it. Mm -hmm. And that looks really, that always looked really good to me when I was looking at like Capcom promo art and it was like the <laughs> like, like illustrations of all like the Street Fighter characters and the Capcom promo art and they have big chunky brush strokes on them. I was like, that looks awesome. And so like I, uh, I was like trying to figure out how to do that by using, you know, Photoshop and I've sort of stumbled on a process. And um, the way I, I control my edges is by turning my flow down. I use a hard brush, but I turn the flow down really low. And that makes it so that like the terminals in my strokes get soft. So that depending on whether I'm going left or right or up and down, it can be soft on like one side or another without me having to like rotate stuff or like do anything. It really is just a matter of like the action of my brush creates like harder or softer edges based off of the way that it's moving across the surface, which is very natural and very dynamic without it having to be, um, you know, without having to mess with it too much or even switch brushes. I'm able to get a nice painting look out of it. See, I don't need to be precise about anything. I'm not very, I'm not a very precise uh, uh, craftsman. I, I'm not good at pulling a straight line. I, 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 mm -hmm. I have to zoom in a lot. I don't have a very steady hand. So I built like a tool set that allows me to kind of scrub away at something and get the get the reactions I want. All right. Yeah, your cool. painting press is Welcome so back. smooth. Welcome back, dude. Yeah, yeah. You you would have think I've learned my lesson not to drink like a whole canteen of water doing an interview, but interview. Sure. sometimes I'm talking so much that I forget that during interviews I barely have to do any of the talking at all. It's great. Yeah. I get to listen. I get to learn. Uh huh. Okay, I'm gonna try. To, I'm gonna shoot some at you. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. From Anthony says, "What were some of the struggles you had starting off your career, and how did you overcome them?" Uh, starting off my career, um, let me think. I mean, the biggest struggle was just to get anyone to notice you exist at all, mm -hmm. and that was really a slow burn because I I started building my audience in deviant art 15 years ago, so anybody jumping in right now, it's just like a totally different landscape. Um, because, you know, getting noticed in, in new on DeviantArt is like not a way to start a career. I mean, you should be on Instagram and using tags, right? Yep. Um, you should be participating in places where artists hang out, like um, online and like, you know, you should be on Twitter, like TikTok. I guess. I don't know. Maybe. maybe on, we'll see. We'll see how that grows. I can't, I can't get a hold of TikTok. Um, but yeah, and then the, the other, the one, I had a big uh, inflection point where I thought I wanted to do book cover art because that was what I knew paid more than Magic the Gathering art. And I was already doing Magic and the most I made ever in a single year from Wizards of the Coast, and this was me as like one of their top artists who was also coming in house to help them build worlds, was $28,000 a year. <laughs> Which is like how much you make like bagging groceries at the grocery store. Like it's less, it's less than what you make working in a grocery store. So um, I was wow. like, okay, I got to get paid more. So I got to get book cover gigs. And then I'm talking to people and they're telling me how to get work doing book covers. And like they're, they're what they're telling me to do is like pulling me away from, they're like, okay, well, number one, your characters need to have faces. And I'm like, fuck, okay. So I guess I'll take all this Angelarium stuff and throw it in the garbage. And then realizing that the Angelarium stuff is what I wanted to invest in and there was a business plan for that. I was like, okay, well, I'll take everything with faces in it and throw it in the garbage. And like, 
that was a really counterintuitive move. When I started doing Angelarium full time, I had already been with the project. I had been doing the project since 2004. And this is like 2014 that I made this pivot. I, um, I took all of my popular Magic the Gathering art and I took all of my brand new portfolio pieces and I threw, didn't throw them away literally, but I like stopped bringing them out to shows in favor of bringing seven year old Angelarian paintings, you know, some of the series two stuff, because that's what I had that like fit the brand. And uh, I, I focused on that one thing. And like the, it was like this weird moment because like, I went from struggling to try to get people to art directors to take me seriously for book covers to like having way more work than I could possibly get done in a day because yeah. things were popping off for my brand. Um, and so the struggle there was to realize where I need to be putting my time in order for me to be getting the results that I wanted because it wasn't obvious. And everyone I talked to who was really smart and really experienced who I was like paying money to be at workshops with them and stuff. Yeah. Not one of them gave me the advice to do what I ultimately ended up doing, which was the only good option. Um, they all gave me advice based off of what I was, they all, always gave me the correct answer to whatever question I was asking. But the yeah. real struggle was figuring out what question to ask in the first place. Um, and I think if I had asked them the correct questions, they probably wouldn't have even had the answers. No, because I, I feel like you definitely paved your own path that they weren't familiar with, was available. Well, I, yeah, but I mean, I had hints that the path existed. Yeah. And it was just like, it wasn't familiar to the people who were like, I was coming to you for advice. It was like outside of their realm of experience. You, know, you go to somebody who, who does book covers for a living, who like has been living off of freelance money, working with big brands, and you're like, Hey, how do you do a good Kickstarter? <laughs> They'd be yeah. like, how the fuck do I know? Um, you know. I like how by answering this question, you actually literally answered my next question, which was from Drea Drez, Draws and said, your angels don't hardly look human and I love it. And I'm wondering your thought process and how you push your pieces so surreal. Oh, uh, visual metaphor. I start off with like, every piece starts off with what it's going to be about. So it's like angel of annihilation. Okay. What do I associate with annihilation? Like, is there some larger thought or memory or idea that I associate with that brief? And so I define the boundaries of what that piece is going to be about. And then I use images to illustrate those ideas. And so um, it's a dynamic process where I don't know what the final piece is going to look like. I just know what I want to get out of it. Yeah. And so it's a matter of experimentation and, you know, discovering stuff in the work as it's happening to try to best fulfill the needs of that piece. And uh, to me, that's worked way, way better than uh, A, doing what I was doing originally, and I've showed off some of these older work, which is like, just make a cool painting, you know? <laughs> it's a good drawing, so it should make a good painting, so you just finish it and you, you put lots of cool things in it, you know? It doesn't work. Um, even, if it, even if you're really happy with the results, most people will ignore it. Like the way that it ends up resonating with people yeah. It's because they recognize it on a conceptual level. They say, I understand how that feels. And so starting with a feeling, a memory, an idea, and illustrating that thing will produce real will will produce better results than trying to look cool a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> and so I don't seek I, I have certain rules for design aesthetics, like oh the watchers do stuff like this and the seraphim do stuff like this. But I try not to get in the way of my ideas. Like if I try not to say no to myself too much. And so I set out with an intention mm. of what I'm going to do. And then I just say yes to whatever comes up. And I don't overthink it. Because the more I, I like get mired into what I think the piece is supposed to be, yeah. the more I'm just like letting other people's ideas of what I think is cool like in and not just listening to myself. <laughs> that was great, Pete. Yeah. I've had this conversation plenty of times. And I know. I feel like it's yeah. territory for me. It's just digging through <laughs> your memory files of, oh, okay, here's the answer for this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a, I've, I haven't gotten one that really stumped me in a long time. Because I have this conversation so often. I like it. I, I, like having, I like talking to people about this stuff. So I'm, I'm 
I'm, I, every time someone's like, hey, can you come on my podcast and yell at me about the same three things you're interested in? I'm like, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 of course. <laughs> All right, well, I'll get a few more because I know we're already over time and I don't want to take too much of your time already. Sure. Okay, so this one, I mean, Eris has asked this a few times, so I feel like I should be asking. Uh, Pete, do you have any tips for improving on uh, landscape slash architecture art in other environment or background art? I thought it'd be funny if I just answered whatever question was going to come up with a flat no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should have done that. I don't want to say no, but I do have some stock answer for this. <laughs> I wish you were like, uh, no, next question. Thank no, you. No, yeah. Well, no, I was about to, but then I'm like, oh, actually, I do have something to say. All right. So the thing that people don't realize about rocks and trees and shit is that it has a motion, not emotion, a motion. It has dynamic motion to it. Even things that are standing still do not look like they're standing still. Like if you look at a tree and imagine yeah. it like it's an explosion that's green, you're like, oh shit, a, a tree and an explosion kind of do look the same, right? Because you have all these oh. radiating lines of action coming out from a center, central point. And so the thing that you, people do wrong with environments is that they fail to find lines of action and motion in rocks and trees and clouds and stuff. But then the thing they also do wrong is that when they realize that, they draw a bunch of pointy rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my it's favorite true. thing true. to paint is clouds because you just get to choose whatever action or motion or texture that you want in the background and you just do that and it's like a it's it's a justification for having an abstract background without it looking like you're just splattering paint everywhere yeah it, it's like you know if you want to show that there's radiating energy coming off of a guy you just put a cloud behind him that has radiating lines of action coming from it and it's like a total freebie and I feel like it's underappreciated um, by people who don't draw. Like if, if you look at uh, environment painters and just start looking at it from the perspective of everything is like trees are like growing really fast or like rocks are like flying into position from where they were originally all flat. You know, mountains are springing up out of the ground and you start to see like this action that's happening and you go, oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I was missing. And that's what most people miss when it comes to landscapes. That's such good advice. I'm going to use that. I never thought of it like that. Yeah, well, you, you, you are always putting like a dynamic action into like the textures and, and stuff, even like the random abstract stuff in your work. It's like, just do the same thing, but with, uh, it's also a rock or a tree or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it, it instantly works. Trees are infinitely more fun to paint as soon as you... You stop worrying about whether or not they're supposed to go straight up and down. Yeah. You just start drawing whatever direction you want to start putting a line of action. You just start drawing a wiggly line over there. And it turns into a tree, and it's a blast to paint it. I, I so love thinking fun. of them like explosions. I think that's such yeah. a cool just way to work them. Bursts of flowers, bursts of leaves, just like popping fireworks of greens and pinks and yellows and blues just popping onto the thing. And you just look at a really good landscape painting and you go, like, oh, fuck, that's what I was missing. It was there the whole time. Yeah. It's like dynamic and in motion and, and like, and, but also balanced with like rest areas and flatness. Like it's, there's a rhythm to it. And when you start looking at everything less as like, what is it representing and more of it as a rhythm, like you realize that like every good image is basically just carrying this, you know, creating a kind of dynamic rhythm to it. Yeah, and that's like what the whole composition game is all about. And you see artists come up with cool solutions to stuff and it doesn't really matter whether it's a character or a background or an environment or whatever. And it's all basically doing the same thing. And it's like, that's also how abstract art works. I think that's why an abstract painting is good or bad is because it's, it's doing the same thing. You don't even need to be drawing a subject matter like tree or whatever, you know. I love that so much because I avoid background specifically because of this reason. Mm -hmm. But now I'm going to start viewing it in such a different light because now all of a sudden trees and rocks don't just become tedious. <laughs> yeah, you, like, you draw a tree and you're like, oh, well, what do I want the gesture of this tree to be? Yeah. You find something really interesting and you find ways of accenting it and like having these little fractal motions that like spin off from it. And then you're like, well, what's going to be at the foot of it? And then you realize, oh, all of the the crap, all the smaller plants and all the rocks and everything that are like nearby, they can follow the same thing and support it the same way that you've made anything else. And when you start letting go of 
what you think should be there yeah. and you just start putting down what you want it the what you want to be happening you can um you, this this new world opens up where you're just like oh i just put whatever the fuck i feel like there and it looks great like the more it's like aligns with your feeling the better the results get and then it t turns out it doesn't matter what it is that was that was that was profound pete that was great <laughs> that was great <laughs> Okay, so then I think I'll do three more. You ready? Sure. So this one's kind of, this one's from the same user, Galaxara, and uh, there's kind of two questions within this one. It says, how do you deal with stress or the feeling of pressure to perform? And do you have a P.O. box we can send you fan letters? <laughs> I don't have the, I, I don't, I have a P.O. box. I don't have the number in front of me. Um, it's in the other room. I can get it at the end of this thing. Okay. Um, what was the first question again? <laughs> <laughs> How do you deal with stress or the feeling of pressure to perform? Two different things for me. Um, I get to use, I, because I preserved art as being like a special fun thing, I am able to use it as a stress escaper rather than a stress creator. Like there's a mm. certain amount of, oh, fuck, I need to finish this painting by the 30th, which I need to finish this painting by the 30th, right? <laughs> But when I go to work on it, I'm not like, I need to get progress on it faster because I've, I'm experienced enough to know that the more you try to rush through a pain, the worse it gets and the more you're in trouble. Yeah. So I know that the fastest way to get this done on time is to just figure out what the painting needs and work on it seriously. And just the biggest thing is just making time for it. Like putting other things aside. Okay, I'm not going to do my email for a few days. People are going to be angry at me. Fuck them. I need to have this time for this painting so that I don't like betray the intention of it. I don't betray the trust of the painting. Mm. Gotta like do that. And as far as stress goes, I mean, mostly video games. Like I just, <laughs> I, I don't deal with stress super well. I um, naturally start to just sort of devolve into like wanting to do something really compulsive. Like I need to stay away from match-based online multiplayer. Um, because I will always be going for one more game. And I need to stay away from games that have any kind of grind to them. Like I yeah, never MMOs. got Monster Hunter uh, because I knew that it would just blow a two month hole in my life and I wouldn't get anything out of it. Um, and I, I can't play MMOs because it just, it turns into an addiction problem for me. And because it's so good at me, like getting stressed out and then trying to cure the stress with something that feels good in the moment and then that wasting my time and then me getting more stressed because I'm more behind on shit. And so um, I've tried to build in better habits like, oh, I'm going to meditate more or I'm going to exercise. And those things help tremendously. But I'm very bad at keeping up on the, my best habits, especially when I'm really behind on stuff. Like the more I think about how much I just want my books to be done and out, the less I feel permission for myself to um, to do things that are healthy for me. Yeah. Like there's a certain amount of self-flagellation I always feel where if I'm doing a bad job, I don't deserve good things. And so I will specifically do things that are unhealthy as a response to me feeling like I'm letting people down as a matter of almost like self punishment. Like, hey, I'm going to just go, I am going to download Monster Hunter <laughs> and lose two months of my life and be behind on anything and feel miserable. Because I'm falling behind and I'm letting people down, I should just do what like a horrible troll would do, and be a horrible troll person. And like make it even more true. Yeah, yeah, just like fulfill that. And so there's a certain amount of like self fulfilling negative ideation that like creeps in, and it's I have not gotten ahead of it. Um, so I mean, I, I'm I'm speaking pretty authoritatively about a lot of stuff here because I'm I'm very certain I'm right about a lot. <laughs> but when it comes to like, hey, how do you deal with stress? How do you like stop procrastinating? I'm like, I'm working on it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking get off my back. <laughs> <laughs> I know things that are the right choices. <laughs> the fact I've been I've been total failure at enacting them makes me not want to speak from a position of authority on this because I hate the idea that I would be spouting off about some bullshit that I that I like really know nothing about. Yeah. You know. So if that puts the the level of emphasis, I, I feel like maybe that answer puts 
a certain amount of emphasis on all the previous answers. Yeah. Where I would, felt like I, I knew I'm telling people as though I know exactly what to do because there are certain things I know a lot about and I'm very certain of and that I've been able to do myself and I've been able to replicate with other people and I'm very certain they're true. And then there's other things that I am, I feel like I'm a total failure on and I really want to solve them. And if I do someday, I'll be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should just open with this question. <laughs> yeah. Because... I mean, but it's like what you say. It's always a balancing game and figuring out how to balance it. And I don't yeah. think anyone has yeah, the right answer. answer like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like I don't think any of us really know for sure, but we've learned things that work for us. I mean, who knows? Maybe video games could be a healthy de-stressor for you. Unless if it's League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, the League of Legends, it's just making me miserable. Yeah. It's just descending into a sort of self-hatred. And then, no, and then it's enacted upon by the people you're playing with, because then there's hatred coming toward you, and then you're spouting hatred. It's just a, it's a hateful game, but I like it. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, um, it's sort of like, you know, Instagram is to most people's lives. It just makes them feel bad. Yeah. You know? um, I think there's probably somebody who they feel better as a result of League of Legends, but I think most people it just, I think it's better as a sport than it is as a as a game because it, it like, yeah, it, it's one of those things that just like on average just makes people feel miserable. Like it just it makes you feel like it's like eating the entire tub of ice cream, like you wanted to do it at the moment, but you just feel walk away feeling sick to your stomach. Oh yeah, that's a good. That's how I come away from some of these games. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's common and that it's just unaddressed for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, ready? Um, no, yeah. We got two more. From Felix says, you worked for games and commissions first before going independent. Looking back, would you have been able to start doing original stuff only right out the gate? Yes. Fuck. This is like one of my <laughs> things where I learned some stuff while I was working professionally, like for other people. I don't think... I mean, I'm still professional, I guess, because I make all my money from art. But when I was working, when I was making money for other people, I uh, I was learning stuff. So I can't discount it entirely. But I really have a strong, the thing is, it's like I was showing those early Angelarian pieces. And um, the stuff from 2006 was up to the point where if I was just really good at branding, the competition back then was way easier. Like the competition has ramped up a lot over the last yeah. 10 years. So if I was going out on the road and building a website and like, it turns out I missed the entire phase where selling art on eBay was really easy. Like talking to artists who have been selling art online for 20 years, they'll, they'll tell you like, oh yeah, there was this time where you could basically charge whatever you wanted on eBay. And there was just like millions of people buying whatever random art on eBay all the time. And it was easy to make thousands of dollars just by throwing stuff up, throwing listings up there. And then they changed their algorithm and then it stopped working. You know, people's purchasing habits change for something. So, like, if I had known about the early days of online selling and caught the wave earlier on certain social media, like, if I was on Instagram, like, three years earlier, I'd have a million followers instead of 300,000 followers, easily. Um, and yeah, it's just like... that snowball. Yeah, and it's like I got that snowball running way later as a result of me doing... If I had done 50 more Angelarian pieces instead of 50 Magic cards... Yeah, there's some people who wouldn't have heard of me, but there's like, I guarantee you a million more people who have never heard of me that would have heard of me. Like, I think my following would be bigger. I think my business would be larger. I would be more successful had I not gone and made money for other people, but instead kept it all for myself right from the beginning. Um, and I would be better as a business person because all the learning lessons that I've had over the last five years, I would have learned them 10 years ago um, instead of five years ago. And it would I would be further along in my journey. I'd maybe be a not only more successful but also a more balanced and happy person as a result of like all these lessons being learned earlier. I really think that I got more out of my time being independent, and I wish I had just skipped straight ahead to it. And then I I've reinforced this belief because I've met kids coming out of college that have the same mindset and advantages that I do, and they're rolling straight into it, and they're just performing close to the top. Mm -hmm. uh, right oh, out yeah. of the gate so like you know i i know it's possible for people to just skip the whole make money for other people step and just go straight to making money for yourself if this is a good fit for you which is an if that i can't answer for you so yeah i'm not advocating for everybody 
But for the people it's a good fit for, fuck everybody else. Go make your make your fortunes. Well, it's like our, our friend Devin. She's younger, but look at her, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think of Devin as being understanding this game better than 99% of the people in it. And she's, what, like... I think she's early 20s. Stupid yeah, like that. it's like early 20s. Yeah, early 20s. She's like she's like more than 10 years younger than me. And I just think of her as like being, oh, well, we're like even as far as like knowledgeability on this stuff goes. Because we've had like a similar number of years of taking it seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, except that she ended up doing it at a younger age. But it's just like, yeah. you know, similar amounts of experience, similar feedback from the marketplace, similar insights. You know, I talked to her about this stuff and we're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like understanding each other and like having a similar experience and like, you know, having a similar take on a lot of the same topics as a yeah. result of just like, you know, looking at it from the same perspective. And that just, it doesn't take, it doesn't take making art for 20 years to do it. No. No. Um, but it's like, I mean, her as an example also, she was going to like an art high school and was like starting this whole like being serious about illustration thing, like at the age of like, uh, you know, like probably like five or ten years younger in her life than I was. Yeah, because you know, it's just after puberty, you can basically just start training straight into your profession. If you get really lucky and you pick the right track right after you go through puberty, you can just like basically start doing college age stuff and just like skip ten years of your of your life progression. It's just that like it's not a good idea for most people because knowing what you want that young is really really hard. Yeah. It's super not common. I mean, I feel lucky for figuring out what I wanted as young as I did um, because it's allowed me to get this far by the age of like mid thirties. Um, it's entirely possible for someone to do it in their mid twenties, but they need to basically like go hard on it from like mid teens. And that's, it's not realistic to expect out of people. And that's the reason it's so rare. Um, yeah. The yeah. real gift is a matter of like early uh, luck in picking a direction early more so than, you know. Well, and even something that Devin does that I think you see other young artists, like even Ross draws, I think they're intuitive and they're very good at picking up like what works and then like building upon that. And then it just like really snowballs because then there might not be someone doing that already. And they kind of found this like empty pocket and then they get to sit in it. Well, I've talked to, you know, Ross and I've talked to Jamila and I've talked to um, Devin and I've run this idea past them of just like not giving a shit about what people actually want and just like being really selfish about it creatively. Yeah. And they're all like, yeah. Yeah, they already you know, get well, it. I care about what anybody thinks about this. I'm trying to make myself happy here. Yeah. And like they all, they, they've all, I mean, maybe it's the language I was using at the time. Maybe they, if you ask them, they will, they'll refute it. But um, I, I honestly think that that is like, when somebody has a lane that they come at really hard, it's because they, it's something that's really honestly like what they want. Yep. And uh, you combine that with like, the, like some people, they do that, but then they draw some sort of weird uh, fetish art that there's like a, almost no market for. And, uh, you know, so it's not like it's a guarantee to success, but it's like the way you make, yes. the, the way people become successful is that combined with luck. <laughs> <laughs> and I just I don't see a way past a certain point without that level of dedication and honesty combined with luck. Um, so I think that yeah. I think that most people who yeah. are never going to get that far with art are honestly just being held back. Well, it's a combination of of lack of work, edit, and lack of luck. I think both are entirely possible. Yeah. I that's why I don't hold it against people when they don't um, they don't find a market for their work because some of them are being really really some work really hard at it and they're super honest about it and they don't make it are you saying it's perhaps because weird. the market they're trying to make it in in is such a niche that it would be impossible yeah, no, like, to like... The, the work they really want to make the stuff that they're most most passionate yes. about that's really honestly them and they're working really hard at it and it's not enough for some people that, you know, their best shot is not a good enough shot. And so I don't believe that anybody can do this. And it's also not their fault if they can. Yeah. It's scary. I mean, it's, it's tough love for sure, but I, I think it does. It rings very true. 
it's it's scary and i that's part of the reason i don't want people to wrap their self-worth up in this stuff it's because like there's a chance yeah. that you just get totally stomped on by life and that you you know and it, you're not a bad person because we're like worthless because you didn't get ahead with this yes that, most people i was gonna say that's really rare to succeed at this thing and it's so difficult to separate self-worth and how well you're being received through either your art or how much money you're making through your art. Because I think as artists, yeah. we are, tend to be more sensitive to begin with. So it's hard to detach that. So I, I know I deal with it a lot. So I, I think that leads into my last question for you. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for this? Yeah. What, what brushes do I use? The what? Are you going to ask what brushes do I use? <laughs> no. I was going to ask one of my own questions. Go for it. What keeps you happy? Uh, what keeps me happy? Huh. Um, the happiest I've been in the past five years was during a time when I was putting my life in balance and I was taking care of myself. I was like cooking and cleaning a lot. I was exercising regularly and I was also getting my work done. Yeah. And letting go of things that I wasn't getting done. And um, I remember I was like hanging out with someone and he's like, why are you smiling so much? <laughs> <laughs> I was just smiling a lot at that time because I was like really internally happy like all the time. And then so now when I'm unhappy, I don't lay it at my own. I don't blame myself <laughs> like you would be more happy if you were to make another hundred thousand dollars or you'd be more happy if you had a better car. You'd be more happy if you had a bigger house. You'd be more happy, you know, if you, uh, you know, went on a fancy trip. I'm just like, I know none of that stuff would contribute to my overall happiness. Yeah. What I know, happy, what keeps me happy is like how I'm structuring my life day to day and what I have to look forward to every single day. How do you feel you're at with that? notion or that concept right now right now bad <laughs> <laughs> right now i am the coronavirus thing is fucking bumming me out and um you know i'm stressed out about the uncertainty of the future because like i'm in better position than most people but i'm also wondering how bad is this economy going to get and how much is that going to basically force me to scale this down to a point where things start to get tight around my household mm -hmm. you know and I'm just like, well, that sucks. That like looking forward to things not good. Um, not being able to go anywhere or exercise or really take care of myself, bad for the well-being. Also, um, I'm trying to juggle stuff because I'm trying to, you know, spin up and adapt new things while wrapping up on like this old obligation of this book that has made me the um, yeah. the fact that I like did such a bad job. There's like an entire podcast of how do you of me learning how to reinvent publishing failure by failure <laughs> over the course of four years <laughs> instead of just looking up how to publish a book <laughs> um and like the process of learning how to become a self-publisher with mm -hmm. well not like letting go of my pride so much that i like open myself up to greater learning like me telling everyone you got to open yourself up to like experience outside the art circle is advice I'm, I'm sort of doing from an inauthentic finger waggy perspective because <laughs> i did a really really bad job um inspecting what it takes to publish a book yeah um <laughs> and so i decided to like make all my own mistakes which is the stupidest fucking idea ever and so like yeah, I'm I'm in the middle of pushing out the very last of that. And I'm I'm on I think I'm on the other side of it, like totally. Oh good. Cause all the like all the interior files are done and off to the printer. And I'm just formatting up the last few bits. And now Elaine is like fighting with Mark to try to like get a solid answer so when we're gonna see proofs and shit. Oh yeah, solid answers with Mark. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's also her job now because she's not on the road. Um, so <laughs> it's like, I have been stressing out so much over trying to get this wrapped up and grapple with all the negative feelings of all the people I let down as a result of, of, um, doing a bad job, getting this thing out in a timely manner. 
yeah. while also keeping up with my regular responsibilities while also worrying about the future. And then the kids are never out of the house. So I've got two kids that are always like making each other upset about bullshit, <laughs> you know? And I like never get, there's like so, it's so hard to like just have a relationship with my wife and have like regular adult time where we go out to brunch or whatever, or have the house to ourselves during the day. Yeah. Specifically it's brunch. Like lock. <laughs> I've got my bunker and even in here, it's not soundproof. So it's like, I can just hear like the complaining and the banging around in the other room. So it's just like, I don't feel like I have any escape. <laughs> well, I mean, it's that, everybody right now, right? Say, we're all locked inside with whoever we're locked in with. And we're like, it's a mixture of like great experiences being close with people and also just frustration of having no choices and God damn it. Yeah. There's a lot of up and down. I mean, even me and Josh watched midnight gospel and like, he, we had a cry session, and then we had like a cuddle, it was really nice, and then the next day it's like, I was getting frustrated because I didn't feel like I was working hard enough on my card deck. So it is like a weird up and down motion right now. Yeah. Well, thank you, Pete. This, uh -huh. honestly, I've, I've never had longer than a two hour interview. You're the first, not only did you break the record, you'll probably hold the record. <laughs> <laughs> if you had asked me if that was what was gonna happen, I would probably say, yeah. I, I can go on on this ship. Oh, wow. I know, and I, I like hearing your words, and I think that's why I kind of was like, you know what, if it goes way over, that's fine, because I think you Anybody give good advice. this on YouTube, and they see that timestamp in the corner, they're like, <laughs> pass, hard pass. They're um, going to be scrolling for the timestamps of, like, I questions. I like the sound of my voice, and it's, like a, and it's not only that, but it's not even just coming from my mic to the recorder. It's, like, coming out of your speaker and into your microphone or whatever for the recording. Yeah. It's, like, low audio quality, nasally drone for two solid hours. So I, like, aggressively yell at them about how their opinions are wrong and their worldviews are wrong. Yeah. It's a real winner. You got nothing on your hands here, Tim. It's the most appetizing <laughs> selection on the menu. Yeah. That, well, no, it's not that. I mean, it's like, yeah, no one should have to listen to me yell at them for two straight hours like this. So how about this? Really quick. I'll do some ending things. If you could find that P.O. box, someone else is asking about it in the comments. Right <laughs> okay. So yeah, thank you all for coming to this live stream. I know, I know, Drea, we hit the three hour mark, or I think we're right under it. I think it has to go on for like another minute and a half and then it would break three hours. I've, I would never assume that someone would want to talk for three hours on an interview live, but... Like I said, Pete's such a good person, and I always enjoy listening to what he has to say, so I'm glad that this was the one to break the record, and I can almost guarantee this will hold the record for quite a while. Oh, thank you. I don't know who that was, but thank you for subscribing. Hey, I'm not, I'm not done yet. All right, <laughs> you can send your anthrax to P.O. Box. <laughs> Here, I'm going to type it out. 15893, Sarasota, Florida. Three four two seven seven. Wait, hold on, hold on. Okay, PO box one five one. Oh, I totally typed that out wrong. Hold on. One five eight nine three. Hold on. Hold on. If you think I'm bad with technology, me trying to find the comment box instead of the emoji finder box is also a struggle. Okay. <laughs> PO box. One five eight nine three. Nine three. Sarasota, Florida. Sarah's. Three, four, two, seven, seven. Three, four, two, seven, seven? That's right. Bam. Got it. All right. Well, thank you, Pete, so much for joining me. Obviously, it's always a pleasure talking to you. But do you have any last words of wisdom you want to partake in? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you again, though, Pete. Honestly, it, it does mean a lot taking three hours out of your day to talk with me and talking with the people watching. Three hours not doing email, I'm telling you. <laughs> right? Just get that ticker going even longer. It will, I'm at like six months and now three hours. <laughs> so yeah, I'm feeling good. Uh, April 30th is Email Debt Forgiveness Day. What is, what's that Email mean? Debt Forgiveness Day. So I, I know you, what you're supposed to do is respond to emails on that date as though they just came in that morning. <laughs> But also, if you really want to play it like hardcore mode, you just delete all your all your emails you're supposed to respond to on that day. <laughs> do you do you do this every month, or is this a real thing? Email debt forgiveness day. Yeah. No, it's it's a it's I mean real thing. It's a thing from a podcast I listen to that has become a little bit of a phenomenon. But yeah. is it the Coming end of every 30th, month? Email debt forgiveness day. Google it. I think you're playing me. 
<laughs> when do I play you? All the time. <laughs> I'm very gullible and I think I'm susceptible susceptible to like new ideas or things that I'm not aware of familiar with because I'm not familiar with a lot. So I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds great. And then I'll Google it and it's like, no, Pete, just put I can see you very easily falling for conspiracy theories, but that that one that one would be a really lame one. <laughs> Thankfully I'm pretty good about that because I, I go into something not fully believing it, but not fully denying it. Hey, what are your opinions on five G? Um, I don't even understand how cell phones work. I still believe <laughs> I still believe it's run by magic. That's my opinion. <laughs> and you want to know more about 5G? I think that we should be more thankful that we can even talk through a piece of plastic and glass and it can connect with someone across the world. <laughs> you think you're gullible? This is like the way this is like the most reasonable <laughs> response to that question I've heard on the internet for a long time. Really? <laughs> Wait, is there yeah. a big is there a big debate with 5G? I see I'm not oh, even aware. People think 5G causes coronavirus. See, I, I, they, in the UK, they burned down like over 55 G towers because they think it's killing people. Like hooligans are like burning these down. They're threatening workers because they believe that it's killing, that 5 G is killing people. Huh. And people wonder why I don't check the news too often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Okay. Thank you again, Pete. If you guys want to follow Pete, if you're not already, all of his links I should have provided below if I did my job right. You and... Can. Yeah, and Pete does do a weekly podcast, and it is one fantastic week. You can check that out as well. It's every Tuesday, correct, at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m.? Uh, 10, 10 Central, 11 10 a.m. 10 Central. Eastern. Yeah. And they're very good. Pete usually either interviews other people, kind of like what I'm doing, or he's training other people. I feel like that's kind of what one fantastic week can become. Where we're yeah. like driving somebody, and we're like trying to help them push their thing forward. Yeah. So yeah, go check it out. And yeah, till next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye, 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 bye-bye.